Chapter 8 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Napoleon Movement of the Nineties. When I reached New York, I found that the situation behind the hasty call to come on and write a life of Napoleon was pressing. The Napoleon Movement, which I had been following in Paris for two years, had reached the editorial desk of McClure's magazine in the form of a permission to reproduce a large and choice collection of Napoleon portraits, the property of a distinguished citizen of Washington, D.C., Gardner Green Hubbard. Mr. Hubbard was popularly known as the father-in-law of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. He was as well the father-in-law of the telephone, since it was largely through his faith in the invention, before it was recognized as a practical utility, and his shrewd and indefatigable work in securing patents, in enlisting supporters, and in fighting rival claimants, that the telephone had been developed and secured for Mr. Bell and his family. Mr. Hubbard had long been a Napoleon collector. The revival of interest in the man in the early nineties had made him feel that his collection ought to be reproduced for the public, but he insisted a suitable text, that is, one he liked, must go with the pictures. Mr. McClure had secured something well written from an able Englishman, Robert Sherard, a great-grandson of Wordsworth, but it was so contemptuously anti-Napoleon that Mr. Hubbard would not allow his pictures to go with it and here it was August, and Mr. McClure, with the headlong speed in which he conducted affairs, had announced the first installment for November. I was both amazed and amused by the idea that a popular American magazine would think of such an undertaking. Why? I asked myself. I had seen the Napoleon movement start and grow in Paris in 1892 and 1893, I had read everything that came along in the way of fresh reminiscences, of brilliant journalism, particularly that of Figaro, and I had tucked away in my clippings a full set of the Carandash cartoons which had so captivated Paris. But I looked on the movement as political, an effort of the Bonapartists to revive the popular admiration for the country's most spectacular figure. If the revulsion against the Panama brand of republicanism could be kept alive, fed, might there not be a turning to Bonaparte? Just as the anarchists took advantage of the situation by hurling bombs, so the Bonapartists took to blazoning France with the stories of the glory that had been hers under the little corporal. It is an amazing record of achievement, and one had to be a poor Frenchman, or poor human being for that matter, not to feel his blood stir at its magnificence. But write a life of Napoleon Bonaparte? It was laughable, and yet how could I refuse to try? In passing through New York in June, I had given Mr. McClure the right to call upon me, promising to join his staff after my vacation. He would give me forty dollars a week, more money than I had ever expected to earn. With care, I could save enough to carry me back to Paris, and at the same time I could learn more of the needs of the McClure organization. The forty dollars a week was a powerful argument. Moreover, I had been talking, largely, about devoting myself to French revolutionary history. If this wasn't that, what was? But there was something else— this man had pulled France out of the slough where she lay when Madame Roland lost her head. I had a terrific need of seeing the thing through, France on her feet. Napoleon had for a time set her there, and brought back decency, order, common sense. I would try, I told Mr. McClure, at his expense, but I should have to go back at once to Paris. Where else would I get sufficient material? That idea of getting to Paris encouraged me to try. But first, we all agreed, I must go to Washington and talk with Mr. Hubbard, look over the collection. Promptly an invitation came from Mrs. Hubbard to come at once to their summer home out Chevy Chase Way, on Woodley Lane, not far from the Rock Creek Zoo. President and Mrs. Cleveland had their summer home on the lane, and the McLean Place, where Admiral Dewey was to go when he returned the conquering hero from the Philippines, was just across the way. Twin Oaks, 
as the hubbard place was called from two big oaks just in front of the house was the finest country estate in the washington district as well as the most beautiful home into which i had ever been admitted mrs hubbard herself was a woman of rare taste and cultivation a really great lady and what she was showed from end to end of that lovely sunny house maids butler gardener all took on something of her dignity and gentleness mr hubbard was a man of some seventy years then wiry energetic putting in every moment of his time serving his friends and family and in worshipping mrs hubbard i think he tried her preference for quiet and dignity and for people of her own kind it must have made her a little uneasy to have a strange woman with a meagre wardrobe and a preoccupied mind drop into her carefree gaily bedecked society but she took it all in the best nature and with unvarying kindness and understanding i liked her particularly for the way she accepted mr mcclure in the days to come he would burst unexpectedly into the house at any moment which suited his convenience his bag loaded with proofs of the napoleon prince and almost before he had made his greeting the bag was open and the proof spread helter-skelter over the carpet being very much on my good behavior i was a little horrified myself and then i did so want them to like and appreciate mr mcclure when i tried to apologize for the dishevelment he wrought mrs hubbard laughed that eagerness of his is beautiful she said i am accustomed to geniuses and so she was as i was to find it did not take me long to discover that there was plenty of material in washington for the napoleon sketch mr hubbard had the latest books and pamphlets it was easy to arrange that i have proofs from paris of two or three volumes of reminiscences that had been announced in the state department i found the full napoleonic correspondence published by the order of the french government files of all the leading french newspapers of the period were in one library or another in the congressional library there was a remarkable collection of books gathered by andrew d white when he was minister to germany from eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty one the bulk of them in german french and english an item of this collection not to be duplicated was some fifty volumes of pamphlets in several different languages made in germany during the revolution and covering the napoleonic era they were for the most part the hasty agitated outbreaks of vox populi protests arguments prophecies curious personal adventures but among them were rare bits taken as a whole they reflected the contemporary state of mind of the people of europe as did nothing i had ever seen convinced of the adequacy of material i reluctantly gave up paris and settled down to work in the congressional library it was not so easy to find a writing table there in the early nineties and it took some persuasion to convince the ruler of the place ainsworth spofford that i was worth the effort that is that i was there to use his books day in and day out until my task was done certain of that he tucked me in those stacks of books rising from floor to ceiling had to be moved to find room i wonder if students in the united states know how much they owe to this man he gave his life making a library first to serve congress for he held the firm conviction that congressmen generally needed educating and that books handy in which he could find materials for their committee work and their speeches would contribute to the process he made it his first business to provide them as near on the instant as possible with what he thought they needed in return for this service he used every opportunity to wheedle shame beg money from them money for books equipment an increased staff and always for better accommodations for mr spofford had a great vision of a national library educating not only congress but the people to realize that vision he had become what he was when i knew him a devoted domineering crabbed czar of his realm he worked incessantly doing everything knowing everything 
he paid little attention to the irritated criticisms of those who saw only the inconveniences and dust and overcrowding of the old rooms and who charged him with inefficiency and tyranny his mind was on the arrangement and administration of the marble pile already under way across the square this was what he had been working for a worthy place for books his sharp irritated there maybe you can find something in that banging a dusty volume on my table has often sounded in my ears as in later years i worked at the commodious desks of the library he had dreamed and which to my mind is a monument to him more than to any other man naturally enough since he was the only man i ever knew who had anything to do with its existence six weeks and i had my first installment ready i had done it with my tongue in my cheek impudence it seemed to me to write biography on the gallop i had kept myself to it by repeating in moments of disgust well a cat may look at a king i'll sketch it in and they can take it or leave it but mr hubbard liked what i had done and that meant mr mcclure hurried it to the printers while i in hot haste went ahead with my sketching i expected nothing for myself from it more than the forty dollars a week and the inner satisfaction of following the thrilling drama from the terror of ninety three down to st helena that satisfied me but to my surprise i did get the last thing in the world i had expected the approval of a few people who knew the field john c ropes wrote me he liked the treatment come and lunch with me when you are in boston and see my napoleon collection i couldn't believe my eyes of course i went charles bonaparte the grandson of jerome bonaparte and mrs bonaparte invited mr hubbard and me to lunch with them in baltimore to see their collection curious the little things one remembers of long ago experiences out of that visit i recall only that mrs bonaparte told me that in the garret when she came into the house where jerome and his american wife elizabeth patterson had lived there were literally barrels of string short lengths neatly rolled accumulated by the sister-in-law of napoleon why remember that when the home was full of treasures on my subject probably because i have never been able to throw away a string without a pang something better worth remembering was the startling resemblance to napoleon in a certain pose of charles bonaparte as he stood talking unconsciously hands behind his back slightly stooped he was the counterpart of raffet's napoleon the most natural of them all a bit of consolation for my hasty work came from the last source i would have expected william milligan sloan the author of an elaborate study the outcome of years of research recently published by the century magazine that was the way biography should be written i told myself years of research of note-taking of simmering and saturation then you had a ripened result i said something of this once to mr sloan i am not so sure he replied that all the time you want to take all the opportunity to indulge your curiosity and run here and there on bypaths to amuse yourself to speculate and doubt contribute to the soundness or value of a biography i have often wished that i had had as you did the prod of necessity behind me the obligation to get it out at a fixed time to put it through no time to idle to weigh only to set down you got something that way a living sketch i couldn't have listened to a more consoling comment there must have been something in his characterization of living for now over forty years since it first appeared in book form i still receive annually a small royalty check for my pot-boiling napoleon what really startled me about that sketch was the way it settled things for me knocked over my former determinations and went about shaping my outward life in spite of me it weakened my resolve never again to tie myself to a position to keep myself entirely footloose it shoved paris into the future and substituted washington it was certainly not alone a return to the security of a monthly wage with the possibility that the wage would soon grow that turned my plans topsy-turvy though that had its influence 
chiefly it was the sense of vitality of adventure of excitement that i was getting from being admitted on terms of equality and good comradeship into the mcclure crowd the napoleon had given the magazine now in its second year the circulation boost it needed my part in it was not exaggerated by the office or by me we all agreed that it was the pictures that had done it but the text had framed the pictures helped bring out their value and it had been done at a critical moment the success of the napoleon sketch did me a good turn with the scribners who had had my manuscript of madame roland for some time they were hesitating about publishing it there was no popular appeal i was entirely unknown but the napoleon work gave me sufficient backing to persuade them at least that was the explanation the literary head of the concern william c brownell gave me thus my first book was my second to appear my reward for writing it came from my interest in doing it what i had learned about how to go at a serious biographical study certainly not in royalties my first check was for forty-eight cents i had used up my share of the small sales in corrections of the proofs and gift copies i must stay with them declared mr mcclure and the more i saw of mr mcclure and his colleagues the more i wanted to stay of my first impression of s s mcclure in paris i have spoken closer views emphasized and enlarged that impression he was as eager as a dog on the hunt never satisfied never quiet creative editing he insisted was not to be done by sitting at a desk in a comfortable office it was only done in the field following sense hunts an omnivorous reader of newspapers magazines books he came to his office primed with ideas possibilities and there was always a chance that among them was a stroke of genius he hated nothing so much in the office as settled routine wanted to feel stir from the door to the inner sanctum and he had great power to stir excitement by his suggestions his endless searching after something new alive startling and particularly by his reporting he stood in awe of no man but dashed back and forth over the country back and forth to europe interviewing the great and mighty he brought back from his forays contracts with stevenson conan doyle anthony hope kipling it was something to find yourself between the covers of a book printing a jungle story they all came out in mcclure's in those years and were followed by captains courageous and stocky as well as many of the greatest of the short stories and poems the ship that found herself the destroyers the recessional things that left you breathless and gave to a number the touch of genius for which the office searched and sweated mr mcclure was always peering over the edge of the future it was this search for what was on the way that brought to mcclure's the first article in an american magazine on radium the x-rays marconi's wireless lilienthal's and octave chanute's gliders langley's steam-driven air runner and in time the first article on the wright's flying machine in my field of biography and history the edge of the future meant to mr mcclure the unpublished or the so poorly published that its appearance was equal to a first appearance the success of a feature spurred him to effort to get more of it things which would sharpen and perpetuate the interest he was ready to look into any suggestion however unlikely it might seem to the cautious-minded he was never afraid of being fooled only of missing something his quick taking of a hint his warm reception of new ideas new facts had its drawbacks if they were dramatic and stirring mcclure was impatient of investigation he wanted the fun of seeing his finds quickly in print at one point in the publication of the napoleon he caused me real anxiety by his apparent determination to print a story for which i could find no authority among the contributors to the syndicate at that time was a picturesque european with a title and an apparently endless flow of gossip he pretended to have been a member of the court of napoleon the third and in the confidence of the emperor this relation accounted for his having been invited to join a strange secret party made up by the emperor 
who was worried over a rumor that the body of napoleon i did not lie under the dome of the invalide it was not known who did lie there or what had become of napoleon to reassure himself the emperor decided to go with a few chosen friends and open the tomb they gathered in the dead of night the tomb was opened there lay napoleon unchanged the emperor's mind was at rest he swore the group to secrecy but took affidavits to be used in case of political necessity the fall of the empire seems to have made the gentleman feel that his oath was no longer binding and that he could cash in on his adventure i did not believe the story but when i expressed my doubt all i could get out of mr mcclure was a severe what a pity you do not know something about napoleon no new idea to me since it was the first thing i was thinking every morning when i went to work what i did not know as i worried over the possible publication of what i believed a fake was that in spite of his quick and enthusiastic acceptance of a good story s s mcclure cared above all for the soundness the truthfulness of the magazine good stories yes but they must hold water stand the scrutiny of those who knew moreover he knew what i did not as yet that he could go the limit in his enthusiasms since he had at his side a partner on whom he counted more i think than he then realized to balance his excitements this happened now the story was in type scheduled mr mcclure was going to europe while you're over there sam said his partner quietly you better verify that napoleon story we'll hold it until we hear from you a few weeks later came a laconic postal card don't publish the story of the opening of napoleon's tomb it wasn't opened i never heard the matter referred to after that by the time he returned he had forgotten what was to me a near tragedy to him a joyful bit of editorial adventure i came later to feel that this quick kindling of the imagination this untiring curiosity this determination to run down every clue until you had it there on the table its worth or worthlessness in full view was one of mr mcclure's greatest assets but it was an asset that would have landed him frequently in hot water if it had not been for the partner who had saved him from the napoleon hoax john s phillips j s p as he was known in the office living in washington as i had been doing i had seen little of mr phillips only heard of him for his name was the one oftenest on mr mcclure's tongue his calm and tactful handling of the general as the office called mr mcclure in the ticklish napoleon story delighted me here's a man i told myself who has a nose for humbugs as well as one who knows the power of patience when dealing with the impatient as time went on and i spent more and more of it in new york finally settling there at the end of the decade i had better opportunities to watch mr phillips in action i was not long in learning that he was the focus of every essential factor in the making of the magazine circulation finance editing into the pigeonhole of his old-fashioned roll-top desk went daily reports of bank balances subscriptions received advertising contracts to be signed books sold i doubt if he ever went home at night without having a digest of those reports in his head he knew their relation to the difficult problem of putting the undertaking on its feet it was largely mr phillips love of fine printing and his habit of keeping track of the advances in printing processes that led mcclure's late in the nineties to set up its own plant it included all of the new miraculous self-feeding machines automatic presses folders binders stitchers it was the first magazine plant of the kind in the country and had many visitors among them was mark twain mr phillips tells an amusing story of his visit as they stood watching the press perform a sheet went awry on the bed the press at once stopped and rang a bell calling for the pressman who immediately came and helped the big automat out of its plight my god man cried mark twain that thing ought to vote it did more than cast votes for mcclure's it saved the money which finally balanced the budget and then some 
to those of us on the inside it was always a marvel that john phillips found time to be an editor as well as a focusing centre for everything that went on at the bottom of his constant editorial supervision was i think a passion for the profession he was unmistakably the most intellectual as well as the best intellectually trained person in the office after graduating at knox college in illinois he had taken a degree at harvard and later spent two years studying literature and philosophy in the university of leipzig when he came to the magazine he put all his training into the professional problem he was an invaluable aid to the group of staff writers the magazine was building up he was no easy editor he never wheedled never flattered but rigidly tried to get out of you what he conceived to be your best taking it for granted that you wanted to make the most of your piece and it was his business to help you i never had an editor who so quickly and unerringly spotted weaknesses particularly in construction he had a fine feeling too for the right word took the trouble to search for it often bringing in a penciled memo of suggestions long after you had decided to let it go as it was he knew the supreme value of naturalness detested fake style a kind of disease i have heard him say quoting somebody it always disturbed a few of us that nobody outside of the office knew what an important part in the making of mcclure's john phillips played he had that rare virtue the willingness and ability to keep out of the picture if thereby he could make sure the picture was not spoiled in the making the one member of the staff besides mr mcclure whom i knew when i began to find myself so to speak absorbed was already by virtue of his unusual gift for comradeship a friend as well as a species of boss that was auguste f giacacci a brilliant artist and art editor as well as one of the most versatile and iridescent personalities i have ever known i first met jacques as he was called by everybody in paris when as an advance agent of the new magazine he was sounding out possibilities for writers and illustrators he took me out to dinner and paid the addition we talked until late then he simply put me on my omnibus and let me go back to the latin quarter alone here was established the modus operandi for our frequent visiting in the future in paris in new york in washington with one revision after that first dinner i paid my share of the check save on special occasions when jacques a knowing epicure selected the dinner and treated me it was he who showed me the first copy of mcclure's that of august eighteen ninety three showed it to me at five thirty in the morning at a cafe across the square from the gare st Lazare, where he had ordered me by cablegram from london to meet him for nobody in the world excepting a member of my family should i have been willing at that hour to cross paris but i couldn't afford to show a lack of interest moreover i must confess that this preposterous order flattered me a little it was taking me man to man i said to myself and so i was there he had to bully the garcon to get a table out on the sidewalk and make us coffee all this was a good basis for a comradeship which lasted to his death it lives in my memory as something quite apart in my relations with men jacques had a certain superior appreciation and wisdom never quite put into words but which you felt i for my part was always straining to understand never quite reaching it part of his charm was his confidence in his own superiority and his anxiety lest we didn't quite realize it and then there were his rages they came and went like terrible summer thunder showers he would roar down the corridor of the office while i sat and watched him enthralled those rages whether directed at me or somebody else never made any other impression on me than that of some unusual natural phenomenon here then were the leaders in the crowd to which i had been admitted by virtue of a hasty sketch of napoleon bonaparte done on order thank god i had sense enough to realize that here were three rare personalities and that to miss such associations would be sheer stupidity also to know that i was an unusually lucky woman to be accepted 
Then there was the magazine they were making. There was something youthful, gay, natural about it, which captivated me. Often, too, it achieved a most precious thing. Mr. Phillips called it a lift. To be youthful, gay, natural, with a lift, that was an achievement. And then I found the place so warmly and often ridiculously human. Mr. McClure was incapable of standing up before a hard luck story, with the result that he brought into that overcrowded office a string of derelicts ranging from autocratic scrub ladies to indigent editors, brought them in, and left them for J.S.P. to place. But J.S.P. was not far behind in his sympathy for those who were down and out. I watched him more than once rescue an author who, perhaps out of sheer discouragement, had taken to drink and landed in jail. Mr. Phillips saw that he was bailed out, his debts paid, work given him. I never ceased to wonder that these two men, loaded with work and responsibility, should seemingly consider it a part of their daily job to rescue the wastrel and the disheartened. There was reason enough for me to stay with McClure's. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Goodbye to France. The Napoleon sketch had not been finished before Mr. McClure was urging me into a new job, not writing this time, but editing, editing according to his recipe. Out with you, look, see, report. Abraham Lincoln was the subject. My heart fell. If you once get into American history, I told myself, you know well enough that will finish France. It will also finish your determination to solve the woman question and determine the nature of revolutions. They will go the way of the microscope in your search for God. Are you to spend your life running, now here, now there, never follow a path to its end? Or was I taking my ambitions too seriously? It seemed probable. However, I was to have five thousand a year if I went along. There was no question in my mind, but it was my duty to earn that money. Lincoln was one of Mr. McClure's steady enthusiasms. I once saw him, in puzzled efforts to find the reason for the continued life of a certain great American magazine, going through the file from the Civil War on, solely to find out what attention had been given to Lincoln. "'Not a Lincoln article in this volume, nor in this,' he cried. "'It is not a great magazine. "'It has overlooked the most vital factor in our life since the Civil War, "'the influence of the life and character of Abraham Lincoln.' "'His insight told him that people never had had enough of Lincoln. "'Moreover, he believed that there was to be had for the seeking "'a large amount of unpublished reminiscences.' It was on this conviction that he started me off. He was right about unpublished material. Lincoln had been dead only about thirty years, and hundreds of those who had known him in one connection or another were still living. His secretaries, Nicolay and Hay, had finished their great documentary life of their chief. They should have personal material not in their volumes. There were members of his cabinet still living, members of Congress of his time, Editors like Joseph Medill of the Chicago Tribune, Horace White of the Chicago Tribune and later of the New York Evening Post, Colonel McClure of the Philadelphia Inquirer. There were scores of men in Illinois towns who had traveled the circuit with him, for whom he acted as counsel, scores of people who had, as a youth, heard the Lincoln-Douglas debates and had been stirred to say, Lincoln's got it right. They had followed him in his fight against the extension of slavery, and later into the war to save the Union. There was indeed no point of his short trail from birth to death where living men and women had not known him as colleagues, friends, opponents, critics. Also, there had never been a time from the day he had become a presidential candidate to the hour of his assassination that his life had not been under scrutiny. Yet it had been difficult to find out much about him. There is not much of me, he told a friend searching for biographical material. 
but there had always been enough to touch deep springs in american hearts and consciences men like william dean howells and j g holland later to occupy high places in our literary life had written campaign lives of him hardly was he in his coffin before his brilliant if unstable law partner william herndon was gathering from all sources reminiscences estimates documents on his life up to the presidency and from his gathering herndon made a story of extraordinary vitality and color most important always to remain most important was the collection of his letters and speeches and the ten volume abraham lincoln a history by nicolay and hay why do more what was there to be had mr mcclure insisted that there was plenty if one searched i went to talk it over with john nicolay who as well as his fine daughter helen was an honored member of the famous old washington literary society where i was a frequent guest i told him what mr mcclure proposed did he not have something he could give me he was emphatic in saying there was nothing of importance to be had the collection of letters and speeches he and mr hay had made was complete they had told all there was worth telling of lincoln's life he would advise me not to touch so hopeless an assignment i think mr nicolay never quite forgave me for going ahead later when the results of my search began to appear and gradually to shape themselves into a life of lincoln he came to me one evening to protest you are invading my field you write a popular life of lincoln and you do just so much to decrease the value of my property i was deeply distressed he thought me a poacher i told him i believed he was mistaken i pleaded that if i could write anything which people would read i was making readers for him to know a little of lincoln was for the serious a desire to know more he and mr hay had written something that all students must have i could never hope to make an essential lasting contribution but he went away unconvinced mr nicolay's point of view if not generous was certainly honest I understand it better now than I did then. He had lived through the great years of the Civil War, always at Lincoln's elbow. He had been the stern, careful, humorless guardian of a man who carried his mail in his hat and a laugh on his lips. His reverence for him was a religion. He had given years of conscientious hard labor to the editing of the complete works and the writing of the history, and now he was retired lincoln was his whole life we all come to rest our case on the work to which we have given our best years frequently come to live on that so to speak when the time comes that our field is invaded by new workers enlarged reshaped made to yield new fruit we suffer shock we may put up a no trespassing sign but all to no use mr nicolay's tragedy was in not having found a fresh field how different it was with his colleague john hay whose secretaryship with lincoln had been an episode in a diplomatic career of unusual distinction and usefulness in eighteen ninety four everybody realized that he had a greater future before him his part in the life of lincoln had been but one of many contributions to the literature of his day his social circle was the choicest and he was rich hay had everything nicolay only lincoln and he looked on all who touched his field as invaders mr nicolay's rebuff settled my plan of campaign i would not begin at the end of the story with the great and known but at the start in kentucky with the humble and unknown i would follow the trail chronologically I would see for myself what sort of people and places those were that had known Lincoln, reconstruct the life of his day as far as living men and women, backed by published records, furnished reliable material. I would gather documents as I went, bits of color, stories, recollections. I would search in courthouses and county histories and newspapers. I would pick up pictures as I went, a picture of everything that directly or indirectly touched on what i was after i would make sure if among these people who had known him there might not be letters not in the complete works 
and if i were lucky somewhere on the trail i might turn up the important unpublished reminiscences which mr mcclure was so certain existed it was a gamble the greater because i was so profoundly ignorant of american life and history it was in february of eighteen ninety five the napoleon work still unfinished though far enough ahead to give me a month for a preliminary survey that i started for the lincoln country of kentucky to begin work on this program it was characteristic of mr mcclure as he saw me off in the deadly cold to take sudden alarm for my comfort have you warm bed socks he asked anxiously we'll send you some if not it will be awful in those kentucky hotels it was louisville aside awful in more than one hotel and train in my first month of lincoln hunting the results were not exciting they were too fragmentary bits of unrecorded recollections a picture a letter a newspaper paragraph a court record which had passed notice what was to be done with them here was no smashing new contribution such as an article of unpublished recollections from mr nicolay might have been but here were bits of value if you were to enlarge and retouch the popular notion of the man lincoln it was soon clear to mr mcclure and mr phillips that what i was collecting must be dovetailed into the published records and that they told me was my business before i knew it i was writing a life of lincoln though the first three chapters carried the legend edited by ida m tarbell the office seemed gradually to conclude that the editor had become the author though i think they were ahead of me in this decision we had a lucky break at the start which launched the undertaking even better i think than the big article we were looking for among my washington acquaintances was a delightful chicago woman mrs emily lyons she belonged to the group of early settlers who were still at this time in the thick of the exciting struggle to make the city the richest the finest physically and socially in the country their energy their daring their confidence their eagerness to learn to adapt was one of the social phenomena of the day now mrs lyon's husband was important in the wealth-producing class as she was in the social she knew practically everybody when she learned that i was interested in new material on lincoln she said at once come to chicago i'll see that you meet robert lincoln and i'll see that he gives you something too good to be true but mrs lyons kept her promise when i reached chicago on my first expedition producing mr lincoln at once now robert she ordered as she filled our cups i want you to give her something worth while to be drinking tea with the son of abraham lincoln was so unbelievable to me that i could scarcely take note of his reply i searched his face and manners for resemblances there was nothing he was all todd a big plump man perhaps fifty years old perfectly groomed with that freshness which makes men of his type look as if they were just out of the barber's chair the admirable social poise of the man who has seen the world's greatest and has come to be sure of himself and this in spite of such buffeting as few men had had the assassination of his father when he was twenty-four the humiliation of mary lincoln's half-crazed public exhibition of herself and her needs the death of his brother tad the heartbreaking necessity of having his mother committed for medical care and more recently the loss of his only son robert lincoln had had enough to crush him but he was not crushed at the moment he looked and felt i think that he had arrived where he belonged the republican party would have been happy no doubt to make him its leader if he had shown political genius recalling that of his father they tried him out garfield and arthur made him attorney-general harrison named him minister to the court of st james but nothing happened he was not political timber but by this time big business wanted him it was his field he was now president of the pullman company i devoured him with my eyes he was very friendly to mrs lyon's order to do his best for me he laughingly replied of course if you say so emily but he went on to say he was afraid he had a little that would help me herndon had taken all his father's papers from the law office 
I think he used the word stolen, but I am not sure. At least I knew he felt they were stolen. He had protested, but was never able to get anything back. As for the presidential period, all the correspondence was packed away in Washington, but it had been fully used by Nicolay and Hay. However, he had what he believed to be the earliest portrait made of his father, a daguerreotype never published. I could have that. I held my breath. If it was true... I held my breath still longer when the picture was finally in my hands, for I realized that this was a Lincoln which shattered the widely accepted tradition of his early shabbiness, rudeness, ungainliness. It was another Lincoln, and one that took me by storm. Of course we made it the frontispiece to our first installment, and the office saw to it that those whose opinions were of value had fine prints of it. It called out some remarkable letters. Woodrow Wilson wrote that he found it both striking and singular, a notable picture. He was impressed by the expression of the dreaminess, the familiar face without its sadness. Charles Dudley Warner wrote that he found it far and away the most outstanding presentation of the man that he had ever seen. To my eyes, it explains Mr. Lincoln far more than the most elaborate engraving which has been produced. A common enough comment was that it looks like Emerson. Edward Everett Hale wrote us that he had shown the picture to two young people of intelligence who each asked if it was not Waldo Emerson. A valuable and considered comment came from John T. Morse, the author of A Life of Abraham Lincoln as well as editor of a series on leading American statesmen. I have studied this portrait with very great interest, wrote Mr. Morse. All of the portraits with which we are familiar show us the man as made. This shows us the man in the making. And I think everyone will admit that the making of Abraham Lincoln presents a more singular, puzzling, interesting study than the making of any other man in human history. I have shown it to several persons without telling them who it was. Some say a poet, others a philosopher, a thinker, like Emerson. These comments also are interesting, for Lincoln had the raw material of both these characters very largely in his composition, though political and practical problems so overlaid them that they show only faintly in his later portraits. This picture, therefore, is valuable evidence as to his natural traits. Robert Lincoln was almost as proud as I was of the character of the comment. If he felt, as well he may have done, that he was taking a chance in responding so generously to his friend Mrs. Lyon's order, he was rewarded by the attention the picture received from those whose opinions he regarded highly. Always thereafter he was quick to see me when I took a Lincoln problem to him, as I did when I had exhausted all other sources. He was always frank and downright. One puzzle I brought amused him no little. It was the recurring rumor that Abraham Lincoln had written a letter to Queen Victoria, early in the war, begging her not to recognize the Confederacy. He was said to have sent it direct. Now no hint, however unlikely, no clue, however shadowy, was passed by in what had become in the McClure office a veritable bureau of Lincoln research. Anything is possible, was our watchword. I was carrying on a widespread correspondence and continually dashing in one direction or another on what turned out often to be wild goose chases, but also not infrequently brought in valuable game. Mr. McClure was especially excited over this letter. The State Department pooh-poohed the idea. The curator of documents in London was non-committal. I interviewed people who were in position to know what was going on, but learned nothing. Finally, I went to Chicago to see Robert Lincoln. His eye seemed harder to me in his office than over Mrs. Lyon's tea table, but he quickly put me at ease. I was certain that my quest was going to seem ridiculous to him. Indeed, it had become a little so to me. But he didn't throw it aside. He picked it up and played with it. He had never heard of such a letter, and doubted if it had been written. If father had done that, he said with emphasis, and Mr. Adams, Charles Francis Adams, then minister to Great Britain, had learned of it, he would have resigned. 
father knew of course that all communication between governments must be carried on by the credited ambassadors and then he fell to talking laughingly of his own experiences at the court of st james he said he had received all sorts of things to be presented to the queen patchwork quilts patent medicines books sheet music i suppose he said that lots of americans fancy that their ambassadors smoke cigarettes a while every morning after breakfast with the queen they take it for granted he can drop in for tea any time and present quilts of course such people see no reason why a president cannot write a queen direct and he laughed until the tears came that interview put an end for the time being to the search for the letter to the queen as the item had come to be called in the office when the life was finally complete mr lincoln wrote me it seemed to me at first that the field had been too many times gleaned to hope for much from the work you were undertaking and i must confess my astonishment and pleasure upon the result of your untiring research i consider it an indispensable adjunct to the work of nicolay and hay mr nicolay however never agreed if robert lincoln was always friendly he threw me once into the greatest panic i suffered in the course of my lincoln work though this was long after the life was published i had gone to ask him if he would arrange for me to consult the collection of presidential papers impossible he said they are in the safety vault of my bank i won't allow anybody to see them there is nothing of my father's there that is of value nicolay and hay have published everything but there are many letters to him which if published now would pain possibly discredit able and useful men still living bitter things are written when men are trying to guide a country through a war particularly a civil war i fear misuse of those papers so much that i am thinking of destroying them besides somebody is always worrying me about them just as you are and i must be ungenerous i think i will burn them i was scared i feared he would do it but herbert putnam the head of the congressional library had already seen to that he did not burn them the library got them finally but with the condition that they were not to be opened until twenty-one years after robert lincoln's death he died in nineteen twenty six the papers will not be available to students until nineteen forty seven which probably lets me out the early portrait set the key for the series and as it turned out a much higher key than i had believed possible i found that court records did yield unpublished documents that every now and then i ran on a man or woman who said more or less casually why we have a letter of lincoln's written to father in blank copy it if you wish occasionally i found a speech not in the complete works by the time the work was put into book form in eighteen ninety nine i had an appendix of three hundred unpublished speeches and letters this did not mean that none of them had ever been in print many of them had appeared in newspapers or historical magazines unpublished meant uncollected on the whole this collection stood the scrutiny of experts very well though i think i was swindled in the case of at least one document a forgery by a man recommended to me by an honest scholar who had used the man frequently for years forgery was easy so was pilfering of documents in those days so little attention did clerks give to their old papers so glad were they to get rid of them there was frequently no objection to a student carrying off anything that interested him one of the most important documents in the controversy over the legitimacy of lincoln's mother is now to be found in the barton collection which the university of chicago bought mr barton probably asked permission to take it home for examination a common enough practice in illinois as well as in kentucky and forgot to return it probably most of the legal documents in the private lincoln collections have been stolen the original thief would have been horrified to have that harsh word applied to him he simply put it into his pocket with or without permission saying i'll just take this along but while i did get together some three hundred pieces i came nowhere near turning up all the letters and speeches then at large i was under a time limit since i ended my search 
scores of items, some of value, have been published in one or another collection. I shall be surprised if, as time goes on, there does not turn up every now and then a genuine letter, though now more than ever caution must be taken in accepting a new piece. The forging of historical documents has become a lucrative trade. From the beginning, I did my best to reconstruct the physical surroundings of Lincoln's homes and activities. I was particularly interested in the setting of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which I followed in their order. But it was not until I reached Galesburg, Illinois, where on October 7, 1858, the fifth debate was staged, that I found the stirring and picturesque material I sought in order to picture the scene of a debate. I was delighted that it should have been the fifth debate, which I have always considered the most important of the series, for it was in that that Lincoln brought his argument down to what to him was the crux of the whole matter, that is, that slavery was wrong and must be kept back or it would spread over the whole country. The debate had taken place on the campus of Knox College, on the east front of its historic old main one of the most beautiful college buildings of that period in the Middle West. I had the luck to find, in Galesburg, a helper who not only enthusiastically seconded my conviction that here was the place for the illustration which we wanted, but set out heartily to help me find material. This was John H. Finley, my old friend on the Chautauqua Assembly Daily Herald. Dr. Finley was now president of the college, the youngest college president in the United States, he was popularly called, doing a piece of work which was winning him more and more recognition. It was through him that I was able to find the newspaper reports of the debate. It was through him that I was able to meet people who could give me recollections of the day. The picture which resulted from our joint efforts was made by that excellent artist William R. Lee, who did many of the illustrations for the series. It has had a continuing life, being reproduced again and again on the occasion of the commemorative celebrations of the debate which Dr. Finley inaugurated in 1896. It was at this celebration that Robert Lincoln made his first and only public address about his father. The real fun of the Lincoln work, as well as some of the worthwhile results, came from setting myself little problems. I was curious, for instance, to know more of Lincoln as a speaker. Whenever I found an Illinois man who had been with him on the circuit or in public life, I would bombard him with questions. He would tell me how Lincoln looked, what his voice was like, how he used stories. They all talked more about the Lincoln and Douglas debates than any other exhibit, but frequently would conclude by saying, Well, those were good speeches, but they were nothing like the lost speech. That was the greatest thing Lincoln ever did. Or a man would begin by saying, Well, you can never know much about him as a speaker. Nobody can that never heard the lost speech. It was, they said, a speech which so stirred his audience that the very reporters forgot to take their notes. Knowing reporters, I was skeptical about that, so I looked up some of them. They all told me that when Lincoln finally ended his speech, they found themselves standing on instead of sitting by their writing tables and without a note. Still, I believe that somebody must remember something about the speech, enough at least to give an idea of the argument. Perhaps, I said to myself, I may pick up some of the phrases, get some real notion of it. So I went prowling about asking questions, and finally learned that in the state of Massachusetts there was a man who was said to have taken notes, a cool-headed man, a lawyer, not a reporter. His name was Henry C. Whitney. He knew Lincoln well, had traveled the circuit with him, had published a life on circuit with Lincoln, with which I was familiar. Of course, there was nothing to do but look up Mr. Whitney, and that I did. To my great satisfaction, I found he had a bunch of yellowed notes. He had always intended to write them up, he said, but when he tried it, the result seemed so inadequate that he gave it up. After much persuasion, Mr. Whitney did get out a version of the speech. When he turned it over to me, I took it to the men in Illinois with whom I had talked and asked them what they thought of it. There were those who said, it's impossible to write out that speech. But there were others who said, yes, Whitney has caught the spirit. He has the argument. He even has many of the phrases. 
as of course he would have if he made notes the most emphatic and enthusiastic statement came from a man of importance joseph medill the editor of the chicago tribune mr medill had been one of the reporters at bloomington in eighteen fifty six when the speech was made who found himself in the end on top of the table without a note he thought mr whitney's version was close to the original indeed he wrote to mr mcclure a long and interesting letter giving his recollections of the convention in that letter he said mr whitney has reproduced with remarkable accuracy what mr lincoln said largely in his identical language and partly in synonymous terms the report is close enough in thought and word to recall the wonderful speech delivered forty years ago with vivid freshness well that seemed to us reason enough for publishing mr whitney's report along with the story of how i had found it what the people who heard the speech in the first place said about it both for and against and that we did but out in illinois there were a number of people who did not want to give up the tradition the lost speech was the greater to them because it was lost as long as it was lost you could make it bigger than any speech any man ever made and nobody could contradict you and so you will find those who claim that the lost speech is still lost and of course you can take it or you can leave it more than once when i plumed myself on a discovery i encountered the loyalty of men to their legends there was the herndon story of lincoln's failing to appear at the first wedding arranged for him and mary todd i realized he rather lets his historical imagination loose in his description but i never had questioned his story until by chance i mentioned it to one of the family a woman who would have been there if there had ever been such a wedding ready she froze me with her indignation. Mr. Herndon made that story up out of whole cloth. No such thing ever happened. Amazed, I flew around to see what other men and women of the circle said. They all denied it. A sister of Mary Lincoln was particularly indignant because Mr. Herndon had put the bride in white silk. Mary Lincoln never had a white silk dress until she went to Washington, she sputtered. But in spite of all the documents and evidences I collected demolishing the episode, I reaped only sour looks and dubious headshakes. I had spoiled a good story, or tried to. It still remains a good story. Every now and then somebody tells it to me. A biographer who tries to break down a belittling legend meets with far less sympathy than he who strengthens or creates one. The most important piece of ghost-writing I ever did came in the course of the Lincoln work, Charles A. Dana's Recollections of the Civil War. Mr. Dana, at that time the active editor of the New York Sun, had had an exceptional war experience dating from 1862 to 1865 as assistant to Secretary Stanton. He had spent much time in the field. He had been with Grant at Vicksburg, with Rosecrans and Thomas at Chattanooga, again with Grant in the Peninsular Campaign. The eyes of the government at the front, Mr. Lincoln called him. No man in the administration had had better opportunity of judging Lincoln, particularly in relation to the conduct of the war, and none was a better judge of character. Could I get the whole story as far as it concerned Lincoln? I hesitated to ask it. The truth was I was afraid of Mr. Dana. I knew him only on the editorial page of the New York Sun. He was too clever, too quick-witted, too malicious for me to get on with, I feared. They laughed at me at the office when I voiced my qualms. Nobody was held higher there than Charles A. Dana. He had been a customer of the McClure Syndicate from the beginning, and they believed in his professional integrity, admired his detestation and relentless pursuit of fakers honored and tried to imitate his editorial motto if you see it in the sun it's so why should you feel this way reproved mr phillips mr dana is a gentleman nonsense i'll take care of it for you said mr mcclure and he rushed to the sun office he did fix it and more for returning he told me with glee that mr dana was willing to give me his whole war story that is, if I would do the work and arrange some practical plan for the interviews. 
the first step of course was to find what dana material published and unpublished was in the war records the editing of the records then under way was in charge of j leslie perry mr perry did not believe in women fussing with history particularly with civil war history war was man's business how can you understand it he shouted at me however i insisted on my rights and nobody could have been more helpful when he considered a thing an obligation of his official position to the end mr perry's chief satisfaction came when he caught me slipping that's what comes from allowing a woman to write history he would say jubilantly between us we brought together a grist of dana's dispatches and reports i crammed on the campaigns and by appointment appeared at the end of mr dana's day about four o'clock in the afternoon for my first interview his desk was stripped of everything that pertained to the newspaper but held a row of the latest books not only in english but in three or four other languages as well as a copy of the cosmopolis an ambitious and rather pretentious review in three or four languages issued for a short time in the late nineties mr dana had already repented of his promise to mr mcclure i am not interested in what i did in the past he said irritably i am interested only in the present i am trying to keep up with the world of today. i am studying russian now a very fascinating language i don't want to bother with what i did in the civil war what do you propose what i proposed was that he let me come to him with a stenographer and a set of prepared questions say three times a week he agreed and for a good many weeks of the winter of ninety six and ninety seven i went regularly to the sun office after the paper was put to press by the summer of eighteen ninety seven i had my manuscript well in shape mr dana had never seen any of it send me the proofs i'll read them publication was to begin in november of eighteen ninety seven mr dana went to london for the summer i sent the proof of the first chapter over with a good many qualms for it was all in the first person i and we it came back with only a few verbal corrections no comments he was never to read more of his recollections the number of the magazine which carried the first chapter carried the notice of his death we published the entire story and later the articles were put into a book but with no credit to the ghost taking it all in all it was the most impersonal job i ever had i do not remember that mr dana ever volunteered a word in all the many interviews i had with him except on the subject in hand and that in answer to my questions we never talked of the things which i knew he loved pictures orchids poetry it was a business-like operation from start to finish probably it was his way of punishing me for being afraid of him another and more important series which came out of the lincoln work was carl schurz's reminiscences here i acted not as a ghost but as an editorial representative mr schurz had given me liberally for my story from his rich lincoln experiences the most important unpublished item being the part he played in helping mr lincoln launch his plan for compensated emancipation as i reported these interviews the office became more and more convinced that here was a great series of reminiscences just the kind of thing that mr mcclure had hoped for when he first commissioned me to gather lincoln material could mr schurz be persuaded to write his reminiscences when i broached the subject he almost immediately said no no i refused gilder richard watson gilder editor of the century I cannot do it for anybody else but i felt so convinced that he ought to do it that i persisted in my begging and finally he began to yield the handsome sum mcclure's was willing to pay had something to do with it for mr schurz was not a rich man and here was a chance to leave to his family this extra money once he had made up his mind to the task he thoroughly enjoyed it and no one could have been more anxious to use material to suit the needs of the magazine working with him was a joy he was gay companionable full of anecdotes frank in comment i remember him best at his summer home at lake george where it was necessary for me to go two or three times to settle some editorial point 
Harry would hear him in the morning as he was getting ready for breakfast, giving the Valkyrie cries, singing motive after motive of the Wagnerian operas in a clear, youthful voice. Sometimes he would spring up from the table where he was at work, and seating himself at the piano would improvise dashingly until the mood which had taken him from his desk passed. Then, back to his labor. The house stood in the upper corner of a park of fifty or sixty acres of woodland, not over-cleared, and open by winding paths down the hillside to the lake. Every turn, every rock had its name, usually celebrating some Wagnerian scene, and as you passed, Mr. Schertz would roll out the appropriate song. There never was a more lovable or youthful man of seventy than Karl Schertz. The completion of the life of Lincoln did not end my interest in the man. He had come to mean more to me as a human being than anybody I had studied. I never doubted his motives, and he never bored me. Still, whenever I have the opportunity, I pick him up. The greatest regret of my professional life is that I shall not live to write another life of him. There is so much of him I never touched. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rediscovering My Country The four years I put in on the life of Abraham Lincoln did more than provide me with a continuing interest. They aroused my flagging sense that I had a country, that its problems were my problems. This sense had been strong in my years on the Chautauquan, but the period following had dimmed it. Now I was beginning to ask myself why we had gone the way we had since the Civil War. Was there not enough of suffering and of nobility in that calamity to quiet the greed and ambitions of men, to soften their hates, to arouse in them the will to follow Lincoln's last counsels? With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. But greed and hate and indifference to the suffering and rights of others had been rampant since the war. Did war, as a method of righting wrongs, so loosen the controls which man, in times of peace, establishes over himself, that he is incapable of exercising the charity, the peaceful adjustments for which Lincoln called? Was there always, after war, an unescapable crop of corruption, a thirst to punish and humiliate and exploit the conquered? Must men go back where they had started? Go back with controls weakened and burdened with a load of new and unexpected problems? True, this war had ended slavery as a recognized institution, given the black man legal freedom. But how about opportunity, discipline for freedom? And then again, was a war necessary to destroy slavery? Was it not already doomed? Lincoln thought so doomed because it was showing itself unsound economically as well as because it outraged man's sense of justice and humanity. And how about the effect of this war on democracy? Were the problems it loosed less threatening to democratic ideals than slavery had been? Were they not possibly a more subtle form of slavery, more dangerous because less obvious? A nice box of problems to tease me as I worked on Lincoln's life, and out of the corner of the eye watched what was going on in the country. The number of things in America I was beginning to want to find out about was certainly dimming the things in France I had wanted to find out about. Unquestionably, these new interests were helping to wean me from the plan on which I had settled. The process was painful. More than once I told myself that the sacrifice of my ambitions, of my love for Paris, for my friends there, was too much to ask of myself. I could never replace those interests and associations. But I was replacing them, and suffering as I realized what was happening, revolting that nothing in my life seemed to last, to be carried through. By nature I was faithful. To give my time to new friends, neglect old ones in spite of never forgetting them, as I never did, was disloyal, 
i was beginning to repeat dolefully as well as more and more cynically to las to cas to pas washington was helping in my weaning the city as i knew it in the eighteen nineties is lost in the washington of the nineteen thirties the pivots on which it swings the capitol the white house were there then to be sure so was the washington monument but they stood by themselves the nearby flanking unpretentious often squalid today they are almost lost in the piles of marble heaped about them to accommodate the ambitions and creations of the last frantic twenty years the town has stretched unbelievably to the northwest where once i knew wide lawns wooded tracts pleasant walks are now acres upon acres of apartment houses and hotels they have engulfed the delightful woodley lane where my friends the hubbards lived in summer and they have changed no less the quarter in which their fine town house stood connecticut avenue where it merges into dupont circle great houses were only just beginning then to find their way into the circle george westinghouse had built there so had Mrs. Leiter of Chicago. Old Washingtonians sniffed at their houses and their ways, laughed at Mrs. Leiter's spinal staircase, as she was said to call it, and professed disgust at Mrs. Westinghouse's reported white velvet tablecloths. They resented the invasion of rich women attracted by the social possibilities of a diplomatic circle, of rich men attracted by the field for lobbying furnished by a congressional circle but of this side of washington i saw nothing my social life was shaped largely by the continued kindness of mr and mrs hubbard i had become almost one of the family was freely invited to meet their friends their circle was wide including diplomats and statesmen and eminent visitors though its core was the large group of distinguished scientists which made up the working forces of the smithsonian institution the agriculture department the geological survey the bureau of mines the observatory an important group they were and nobody in town appreciated them more or took more pains to show his appreciation than mr hubbard naturally the center of this group was alexander graham bell married to the hubbard's daughter mabel the Bells lived across the avenue from the Hubbards, and I soon had the good fortune to be welcomed there. A great privilege, for both Mr. and Mrs. Bell were rare persons. Mrs. Bell's story is well known, but it was only in seeing her with her husband and daughters that one could realize what a fine intellect and what an unspoiled and courageous character she had. She had been deaf and dumb from infancy, and Mr. Hubbard had determined to open life to her among the teachers of speech he brought to her was a young man then at boston university alexander graham bell under his tutelage she made rapid strides and the two young people learned to love one another at that time mr bell was giving his nights to trying to make iron talk i once heard mr hubbard say that when he found mr bell had made iron talk he told him he must develop his telephone to a practical point or he could not have mabel Probably no other argument would have persuaded Alexander Graham Bell, for he was the type of inventor whose interest flags when he has solved his problem. Let somebody else take care of the development. He would be off on a new voyage of discovery. At the time I came into the circle, Mr. Bell was, I think, the handsomest and certainly the most striking figure in Washington. It was amusing to hear people discussing who was the handsomest man in town. There were various candidates, General Miles, General Greeley, Colonel John Foster. But while I conceded they all had their points, no one of them had the distinction of Alexander Graham Bell, and no one of them certainly had the gay, boyish appetite for what he found good in life. He was more like Massa Henry Waterston in that than anybody else I have ever known, though the activities and interests of the two were utterly different. Mr. Bell's plan of living was modeled to suit himself. Often he slept through the day when interruptions naturally came and the telephone most often rang. If restless at night, he played the piano. Mrs. Bell could not hear, and the rest of the family, being young and devoted, were never disturbed. He was up and began his day around four to six, 
often there were guests for dinner for everybody of note the world over who came to washington wanted to meet him on wednesdays after dinner there usually gathered a group of scientists and public men to talk things over mr bell was something to see at these dinners and gatherings the finest social impresario i ever saw in action so welcoming appreciative eager receptive i thought then i had never seen anybody so generous about what others were doing he loved to draw out great stories of adventure and discovery and would silence all talkers when once such narrating was started partly this was because of mrs bell his intense desire that she enjoy everything that was going on and she did thanks to the intelligent devotion of her daughters elsie and marion the first now the wife of gilbert grosvenor one of the founders and the present editor of the national geographic magazine the second the wife of david fairchild botanist and explorer the organizer in the agriculture department of the work now known as the division of foreign plant exploration and introduction two men to whom the public owes big debts for services the most distinguished member of this washington group of scientists after mr bell was professor samuel pierpont langley the head of the smithsonian institution at that time agonizing over the problem of flying when i first met dr langley in eighteen ninety four he was working on his air runner or aerodrome a machine which as i gathered from the talk i heard and did not too well understand was to run on the air as an engine does on rails he finally came out with a machine weighing about twenty-five pounds made up of a pair of rigid wings twelve to fifteen feet across and an engine which weighed not over seven pounds it had cost him four years work to develop the engine to that lightness but would it fly could it be launched attempts were made from a houseboat down the river these experiments were carried on with the utmost secrecy for dr langley was a taciturn man proud dignified always awesome to me he knew that there was a public that thought him a little touched in the head and wondered that the government kept as director of a great national institution a man who held the crazy notion that one day people would fly and who was willing to give his days and nights to proving it dr bell took the most genuine and enthusiastic interest in dr langley's experiments was always present i think when an attempt to launch the air runner was made i recall his disappointment when it fell his rejoicing when it did finally fly this was one day in may of eighteen ninety six i have heard him tell how suddenly the air runner rose to one hundred feet and flew in a big circle it did not fall but made a perfect landing again it was launched and again it flew and this time it went over the land and over the treetops came back to the river and when its power was exhausted settled quietly on the water inside that little circle at dr bell's there was the consciousness of a great discovery a certain solemnity that again it had been proved that labor training thought patience faith are not in vain mr mcclure was as excited as any one of the washington group over the news he must immediately have an article from dr langley himself and i was commissioned to get it i think perhaps it was a little strain on dr langley's good will to have a young woman come to him and say now we want the whole story of how you have done this thing what it means but no scientific jargon please we want it told in language so simple that i can understand it for if i can understand it all the world can which knowing me he probably knew was true he consented and i had the privilege of talking with him occasionally about the article of reading what he did and saying when necessary i don't quite see what this or that means of seeing him docilely make it clear enough for me to understand a year after the langley contraption first flew we had in mcclure's magazine the whole story as a reward for my persistent effort to see that article come out to his satisfaction he gave me what i think he considered the greatest treat he could give his friends he took me to the rock creek zoo after the crowds had gone and with the help of the director dr baker made the kangaroo jump and the hyena laugh 
but the public interest in his air-runner the fresh honours that now came to him did but little to wipe out the bitterness that ridicule had stirred in dr langley there was a time he said as he was going to england to take a degree which oxford university i believe it was was giving him there was a time when i should have been glad of this it means little now yet he had his moments of strong emotion rarely have i been more moved than at a dinner at mr hubbard's soon after the greco-turkish war began in eighteen ninety seven a half dozen men of seventy or thereabouts were at the table among them senator hoare of massachusetts major powell edward everett hale and dr langley they talked only of greece and her helplessness before the turk they recalled the wave of sympathy which in their boyhood had swept over the country when the turk attacked greece it was to greece said senator hoare that he first gave money of his own a long treasured twenty-five cent piece dr hale and dr langley fell to quoting byron their voices shook as they declaimed the isles of greece the isles of greece earth render back from out thy breast a remnant of our spartan dead of the three hundred grant but three to make a new thermopylae it was byron said dr langley with an emotion of which i had thought him incapable who first stirred in me an enthusiasm for man's struggles for freedom with a desire to join those who fight for it he thought byron first opened england's eyes to her duty to the oppressed of the continent of europe and at the same time opened the eyes of the continent to the love of liberty the sympathy with the helpless in english literature certainly here was a dr langley i had never before glimpsed this was not all of washington i was seeing as in paris i set aside time for learning the city how thin and young and awkward washington seemed compared with the exhaustless life and treasures of paris here was none of that wisdom of experience that subtle cynicism that pity and patience with men which made paris like a great human being to me nor was there here the ripe charm of old palaces quaint streets hidden corners everything was new sprawling in the open but if washington had little to offer but promise it had that in abundance and it did not know its own lacks it was too full of pride in what it had done since john adams moved into the white house and congress into the capitol and then i had a problem to think about the washington lincoln knew and i went about with him from white house to war department up to the congress down to the arsenal into this and that hospital up to the soldiers home over to arlington the pain and tragedy behind almost every step he took in the town dignified its unfinished streets gave a meaning and a sanctity to its rawness by such steps i told myself did paris come through the centuries to be what she is but i did more than follow lincoln about i wanted to know the washington of thirty years after lincoln and so i went to the capitol when debates promised excitement and i missed no great official show when mckinley's inauguration came in eighteen ninety six i arranged to see it all once i told myself will do forever for an inauguration as it has done i began after breakfast and did not stop until the inaugural ball was far on its way a fine colorful sight-seeing experience leaving a series of pictures which have never quite faded years later one of these pictures brought me a curious bit of minor political history i was trying to persuade richard olney to write the story of the venezuela message for mcclure's and remarked that the first time i met him was at the mckinley inaugural ball to my surprise he flushed outgoing cabinet members are not expected to attend the inaugural ball of a new president he said i hadn't known that or of course i should not have spoken but there was a reason for my presence general miles then head of the army had come to me to say that there were rumors of an attempt on mckinley's life suppose that both he and hobart should be assassinated before a new cabinet is appointed he said you would be acting president you must go to the ball walk with mrs mckinley and stay until the end 
I didn't like the idea, but General Miles insisted, so I went. But the new president walked with his wife, and I had to hang around, conscious that more than one Republican was saying, What's Olney doing here? What was behind General Miles' precaution, I never knew. The lives of presidents are always in danger, even in what we are pleased to call normal times. There always being plenty of grievances, real and fancied, to be squared. At the moment of the McKinley inauguration, the despair and bitterness of many radicals over the defeat of Bryan were outspoken. The experience of the country with assassination in the thirty preceding years had been alarming. A man in General Miles' position, charged with the safety of the heads of the government, must keep in mind all possibilities. It would, of course, have been easy to assassinate the president and vice-president at the ball. Given clever and determined conspirators, there would have been a chance to seize the government while a new president was being elected. But with a determined man like Olney on the ground, backed by a watchful and sufficient military guard scattered through the great patent office, where the ball was held, a temporary government could have been formed while the murderer was being manacled. How General Miles would have enjoyed such a coup! In the first years of McKinley's administration, I came to know him well. Another one of the friendly acquaintances made in carrying out the varied tasks that came my way in my position as a contributing editor of McClure's magazine. For several years, popular interest in military affairs had been growing. There were several reasons, doubt of the efficiency of our army, talk of revolution, and particularly our strained relations with Spain. Interest was still further excited in 1896 by the outbreak of the Greco-Turkish War, which, starting as a skirmish, soon grew until it looked as if it might involve all southeastern Europe, perhaps England, Russia. Obviously, we should have an observer over there. And so in May, General Miles and a staff started for the field. He studied the military organization of Turkey and of Greece, watched the armies lined up for battle, saw the end of the war. From Greece, he and his staff went to London to represent the United States at Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Following that great show, he attended the autumn maneuvers of the greatest of then-existing armies, those of Russia, Germany, and France. Mr. McClure thought there was an important story in General Miles' observations, and I was commissioned to get it. But General Miles willing and glad as he was to tell of his european experiences he had never been abroad before wanted to tell only of the sights he had seen sights which had nothing to do with armies their equipment and their maneuvers all that was shop for him they'll think i didn't see anything but soldiers and guns he growled that i'm not interested in history and art people don't know how wonderful pompeii is and i would like to tell them a lot of them never heard of Alexander's sarcophagus, finest thing I ever saw. There are countries that would pay a million dollars to get it. And there's the Parthenon and Moscow and the Tower of London and the Louvre. These are the things I want to write about. And he was preparing to do it, as I saw by the stack of Baedekers, the volumes of the Britannica, the pamphlets and travel books on his desk. It took all my tact and patience to persuade the general that, whatever his interest, ours was centered only on military Europe. In the course of this distasteful task, I came to have a real liking for General Miles. He was as kindly and courteous a gentleman as I have ever known, and certainly the vainest. One of the real disappointments of his European visit was that the American uniform was so severe. There were hundreds of lesser ranks than himself on parade, with three times the gold braid he was allowed. When it came to the Queen's Jubilee, he revolted and had special epaulets designed. I was at headquarters the day they arrived from London, and nothing would do but I must see them. He ordered the box opened, disappeared into an inner office, and came back arrayed in all the glory the American army allowed him. I was working on the Miles articles on February 16, 1898, when the Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. As no message came cancelling my appointment with General Miles that morning, I presented myself as usual, 
though with some misgiving, for it seemed as if the very air of Washington stood still. At headquarters there was a hush on everything, but the routine went on as usual. As we worked, an orderly would come in with the latest report. 253 unaccounted for, two officers missing, ship in six fathoms of water, only her mast visible, sir. Then a second report. All but four officers gone, sir, and there are two hundred women up in the Navy Department. The Army and the Navy were in the same building in 1898. The General made no comment, but every now and then blew his nose violently, while his smart chief of staff, a gallant, simple-minded officer with a bullet hole in his cheek, kept saying to himself, Ain't it a pity? By Jove, ain't it a pity? Through the two months between the blowing up of the main and the declaration of war, I vacillated between hope that the President would succeed in preventing a war, and fear that the savage cries coming from the hill would be too much for him, as they were in the end. I honestly believed then, as I do now, that he was doing his best, and this in spite of the fact that my heart was hot with resentment for what I considered his cowardly desertion of my Poland friends in 1893. McKinley was patient, collected, surprisingly determined. Everybody, indeed, in the departments where the brunt must fall if war came, seemed steady to me, as I watched things in my frequent visits to General Miles' headquarters. Everybody was at his post. Everybody except Theodore Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He tore up and down the wide marble halls of the War and Navy Building, like a boy on roller skates, a disgusted observer growled. More than once, he burst into General Miles' office with an excited question, an excited counsel. Already he was busy preparing his rough riders for the war to be if he had his way. Already he saw himself an important unit in an invading army. I remember this because it shocked me more than anything else I was noting. What chance had government in peace or war if men did not stay on their jobs? Was not fidelity to the trust committed to you a first obligation? And if Theodore Roosevelt felt, as he evidently did, that he was needed in the army, did not good manners, if nothing else, require resignation? I was very severe on him in 1897 the more so because he had bitterly disappointed me in 1884 when he had refused to go along with the mugwumps in the revolt against prohibitive protection, refused and gone along with my particular political abomination, Henry Cabot Lodge. I had not been able to reconcile myself to him even when as a police commissioner of New York City he made his hearty and effective fight on the town's corruption. The steadiness of General Miles and his staff in the weeks between the blowing up of the main and the breaking out of war with Spain raised my respect for army training as much as Roosevelt's excited goings-on antagonized me. At the same time, my contempt for the outpouring of Congress in a crisis was modified by almost daily association with one of its oldest members, the senator from Massachusetts, George Frisbee Hoare. When I had decided in 1894 that sufficient materials were at hand in Washington for the sketch McClure's wanted to go with Gardner Hubbard's Napoleon portraits, I went to live at a boarding house on I Street between 9th and 10th, recommended by Mrs. Hubbard, chiefly because Senator and Mrs. Hoare lived there. The neighborhood had been not so long before one of the desirable residential sections of the town but business and fashion were pushing well-to-do residents into Connecticut and Massachusetts avenues, into DuPont Circle and beyond. The fine old brownstone houses left behind were being used by trade, and occasionally by owners, whose incomes had been cut or destroyed, as rooming or boarding houses. The head of the house into which I was received was a Mrs. Patterson, the widow of a once distinguished Washington physician. She and her daughter Elizabeth made of their home one of the most comfortable and delightful living places into which I had ever dropped. Such food! And best of all, the senator. At this time, Senator Hoare was close to seventy years of age. He had been in Congress for twenty-six consecutive years, seventeen of them in the Senate, and everybody knew that as long as he lived, Massachusetts Republicans would insist on returning him. 
he embodied all the virtues of the classic new englander and few of the vices his loyalty was granite ribbed he revered the constitution and all the institutions born and reared under it he was proud of the united states but his heart belonged to massachusetts in his mouth the name took on a beauty and an emotion which never ceased to stir me westerner than i was combined with his patriotic loyalties was a passionate devotion to classic literature greek roman english he knew yards of homer and virgil as well as of the greatest of the early english writers and not infrequently at our sunday morning breakfasts he would repeat long passages in his sonorous voice this was the one hour in the week when the senator laid aside all formality and became our entertainer he never spoiled things by opinions on current events but poured forth daily whatever came into his mind we were a good audience willing to sit until noon if he would talk he claimed that it was mrs patterson's codfish balls and coffee that put to flight all his cares and loosened his tongue that patterson sunday morning breakfast was enough to put gaiety into any heart senator hoar had already celebrated it in a widely circulated letter to a pennsylvania editor who attacked him for never having done a stroke of useful work in his life and what greatly amused the senator living in washington on champagne and terrapin my dear man he wrote the irate critic your terrapin is all in my eye very little in my mouth the chief carnal luxury of my life is in breakfasting every sunday morning with an orthodox friend a lady who has a rare gift for making fish balls and coffee you unfortunate and benighted pennsylvanians can never know the exquisite flavor of the codfish salted made into balls and eaten on a sunday morning by a person whose theology is sound and who believes in all the five points of calvinism i am myself but an unworthy heretic but i am of puritan stock of the seventh generation and there is vouchsafed to me also some share of that ecstasy and a dim glimpse of that beatific vision be assured my benighted pennsylvania friend that in that hour when the week begins all the terrapin of philadelphia or baltimore and all the soft-shelled crabs of the atlantic shore might pull at my trouser legs and thrust themselves on my notice in vain as we all knew senator hoar had no money for champagne and terrapin he had sacrificed his law practice to public service getting a little poorer year by year as a matter of fact he had no interest in making money i never saw him more irritated than after taking a difficult case for which he was to get a fee of twenty five thousand or thirty thousand dollars earning money is hateful to me he said never in all my life before have i undertaken a thing i did not want to do simply for money some things i like to do believe that i can do better than i could do anything else i never was such a donkey before there are so many things i long to do one of them is to learn italian well enough to read dante and boccaccio and ariosto in the original and i want to commit homer to memory i would like to have my head packed with greek the senator's sunday morning talks were rich with anecdotes of new england types he had his antipathies margaret fuller osoli was one of them he used to tell the story of an old conquered doctor who was called up in the night by a quavering voice outside his window asking doctor how much camphor can a body drink without its killing him who drunk it he asked margaret fuller a peck snapped the doctor shutting his window with a bang dr mary walker who in her rather shabby man's attire was a familiar figure in those days was a particular abomination she made him creepy he said simply to mention her i found would dry up his talk but the mention of jonathan edwards name although he particularly detested him always loosened his tongue he was an inhuman cuss he said one morning there is a true story of his riding through northampton with a slave boy whom he had just bought tied to a cord and trotting behind the horse is thee doing as thee would be done by a woman of his faith called him and edward said i'll answer you some other time 
Senator Hoar rather enjoyed calling a man whose acts he disliked by hard names. Indeed, he very much enjoyed salty words generally, and one morning ably defended them. Damn it is a useful word. It eases one's feelings. He also put up a strong argument for whoppers. They are, he contended, a valuable weapon with the impertinent and the imbecile. There was much boyish mischief in him. He greatly admired our wholesome, big-hearted Elizabeth, daughter of the house, her common sense and her gaiety, and loved to pinch her plump arm. He did it in the presence of us all, and in spite of Mrs. Hoare's reproaches. "'Do you know, Elizabeth,' he said one evening, as he followed us up the stairs from the dining-room, "'that it has taken nineteen years of Christian civilization to produce a man who does not pinch a pretty girl's ankle when she is going upstairs ahead of him.' In July 1898, after Congress had adjourned, Senator Hoare made up a party for a trip through the Berkshire Hills, and I had the good fortune to be asked to join it. I had heard him talk much of his walking trips there in Harvard days, with his favorite classmate, Francis Child, as great a man at seventeen when he entered college, he said, as when he died, a real genius. From the moment our little caravan left his home at Worcester, the trip was like champagne to him. Trees, graveyards, epitaphs, views, the homes of the honored in this day and past days kept him busy. There was the Sheffield elm where we must stop to measure, the grave of Mumbet, with the inscription his favorite Catherine Sedgwick had written for it. There was the best view of the sleeping Napoleon on Cedar Mountain, this for me. Then we must spend the night at a certain inn on Mount Washington to give Elizabeth plenty of time to look up family graves and records. Her father had been born on Mount Washington, which was one of many reasons why the senator admired her. He went with her to look up the graves, and returning late said, If we had not feared you would wait supper, we would have stayed and been buried there. I have certainly never known anyone for whom life at seventy was more joyous and full. He hated weakness, as well as everything that impaired his dignity, his self-reliance. He was a true untouchable, and would fall into a rage if friend or stranger offered to assist him. Unhand me, he thundered at a streetcar conductor who one day seized his arm to help him up the steps, and his wrath lasted until he had told us about the indignity at the dinner table. On this Berkshire trip a little accident happened to him, which caused an explosion of the same nature. We were at an inn in the mountains, and after dinner had gone to the lawn. The senator was sitting on a rustic bench which gave way, turned him on his back, feet in the air. We all ran to assist him, but were stopped in our tracks by a stentorian voice which roared, I decline to be assisted. But this was the senator on a vacation the senator of our Sunday morning's breakfast. Take him when public affairs were in a serious tangle, and he was glum, unapproachable. He suffered deeply over the trend to imperialism after the Spanish-American War. To save Cuba from the maladministration of Spain, to watch over her until she had learned to govern herself, seemed to him a noble expression of Americanism. But to annex lands on the other side of the globe, for commercial purposes only, as he believed, was to be false to all our ideals. He had the early American conviction that minding one's own business was even more important abroad than at home. He wanted no entangling alliances, and in those days following the Treaty of Paris, he feared as never before for the country. Certainly there were far fewer Sunday morning breakfast table talks. His greatest speech against the advancing imperialism was made in April of 1900. At the head of the printed copy of his speech, distributed by the Senate, he placed these sentences. No right under the Constitution to hold subject states. To every people belongs the right to establish its own government in its own way. The United States cannot with honor by the title of a dispossessed tyrant or crush a republic. I was learning something of what responsibility means for a man charged with public service, of the clash of personalities, of ambitions, judgments, ideals. 
and it was not long before I was saying to myself, as I had not for years, you are a part of this democratic system they are trying to make work. Is it not your business to use your profession to serve it? But how? That was clearly now my problem. I could not run away to a foreign land where I should be a mere spectator. Indeed, I was beginning to suspect that one great attraction of France was that there I had no responsibility as a citizen. I must give up Paris. Between Lincoln and the Spanish-American War, I realized I was taking on a citizenship I had practically resigned. The war had done something to McClure's as well as to me. In all its earlier years, its ambition had been to be a wholesome, enlivening, informing companion for readers, to give fiction, poetry, science of wide popular appeal, an ambition which, it must be admitted, opened the pages occasionally to the cheap, though it rarely excluded the fine. An eager welcome was given new writers. Indeed, it was always a great day in the office when we thought a real one had reached us. While it fostered new writers, it held on to the best of the old. It had touched public matters only as they became popular matters. Thus, when the Spanish-American War came, it was quickly recognized that it yielded more interesting material than any other subject. There was a great war number, and there was a continuous flow of war articles. McClure's suddenly was part of active public life. Having tasted blood, it could no longer be content with being merely attractive, readable. It was a citizen, and wanted to do a citizen's part. It had a staff sympathetic with this new conception of the work. Mr. McClure had had in mind from the start the building of a permanent staff of good craftsmen, reporters on whom he could depend for a steady stream of contributions as well as of editorial ideas. He wanted them versatile, flexible, as interested in the magazine as in themselves, capable of sinking themselves in a collective effort. After I came in, the first to become such a permanent acquisition was Ray Stannard Baker. An article on the capture of John Wilkes Booth by Baker's uncle, Colonel L. C. Baker, written from personal reminiscences and documents, was submitted by Baker, then on the staff of the Chicago Record. It was the general's ideal of a McClure's article. Baker was urged to write more, and each piece emphasized the first impression. The year after his first appearance in the magazine, May 1897, he joined the staff and became a regular contributing editor. Baker was an admirable craftsman, as well as a capital team worker. He had curiosity, appreciation, a respect for facts. You could not ruffle or antagonize him. He took the sudden calls to go here, when he was going there, with equanimity. He enjoyed the unconventional intimacies of the crowd, the gaiety and excitement of belonging to what was more and more obviously a success. He was the least talkative of us all, observant rather than garrulous, the best listener in the group save Mr. Phillips. He had a joyous laugh which was more revealing of his healthy inner self than anything else about him. When I learned a few years later that Baker was the author of the wise, homely, whimsical Adventures in Contentment, The Friendly Road, and other delightful essays under the nom de plume of David Grayson, I said at once, How stupid of me not to have known it! Haven't I always known that Baker is a David Grayson? Few practical philosophers, indeed, have so lived their creed as Ray Stannard Baker, and none have had a more general recognition from the multitude of people in the country who, like him, believe in the fine art of simple living. It is a comforting and beautiful thing to have had as a friend and co-worker over many years so rare a person as Ray Stannard Baker. By good fortune, McClure's, in this period, happened on a reader of real genius. Viola Roseborough, the only born reader I have ever known. I found her in the office after one of my frequent jaunts after material. It was as a talker that I first learned to admire and love her. Her judgments were unfettered, her emotions strong and warm, her expressions free, glowing, stirring, and she loved to talk, though only when she felt sympathy and understanding. 
she loved to share books of which she read many particularly in the biographical field she wanted none but the best no imitation no mere fact-finding her eagerness to let no good thing slip her consciousness of the all too little time a human being has in this world to explore its riches made her rigid in her choice an unsleeping eagerness to find talent and give it a chance and secondarily she said to enrich the magazine made every day's work with the unsifted manuscripts an adventure if she found exceptional merit that was also suited to mcclure's she might weep with excitement and she stood to it till faith grew in those less sure of the untried it was when mcclure's was making a great hunt for a good serial that i saw her one morning bringing into the editorial sanctum booth tarkington's the gentleman from indiana tears celebrating the discovery as she cried here is a serial sent by god almighty for mcclure's magazine this woman of unusual intelligence loyalty and of truly spartan courage was a precious addition to the crowd ill health threatened blindness have never lowered her enthusiasm her ceaseless effort to find the best to give the best she is still doing it the most brilliant addition to the mcclure staff in my time was lincoln steffens he had made himself felt in the journalistic and political life of new york city by a fresh form of repertorial attack young handsome self-confident with a good academic background and two years of foreign life and observation stephen began his professional career unencumbered by journalistic shibboleths and with an immense curiosity as to what was going on about him he was soon puzzled and fascinated by the relations of police and politicians politicians and the law law and city officials city officials and business business and church education society the press apparently groups from each of these categories work together supporting one another an organization close compact loyal from fear or self-interest or both it was because of this organization steffens concluded that graft and vice and crime were established industries of the city attacks from outraged virtues had slowed up the system at intervals ever since the civil war but never permanently deranged it a few rascals might be exterminated but they were soon replaced the system had bred new rascals grown stronger and more cunning with time he set out to trace its pattern incredibly outspoken taking rascality for granted apparently never shocked or angry or violent never doubtful of himself only coolly determined to demonstrate to men and women of good will and honest purpose what they were up against and warn them that the only way they could hope to grapple with a close corporation devoted to what there was in it was by an equally solid corporation devoted to decent and honest government business law education religion first as a reporter and later as the city editor of the globe stephen stirred the town it was entirely in harmony with the mcclure method of staff building that this able fearless innocent should be marked for absorption he was persuaded to take the editing of the magazine now in its tenth year and steadily growing in popularity and influence he was to be the great executive the editorial head that would shift some of the burden from the shoulders of mr mcclure and mr phillips but the machine was running smoothly even if with little outward excitement stephens made a brave effort to adjust himself to the established order to learn the situation naturally he took mr mcclure's meteoric goings and comings his passionate and often despairing efforts to make his staff see what he did his cries that the magazine was stale dying more seriously than those of us who had been longer together he seems to have been bewildered by what went on in the excited staff meetings held whenever mr mcclure came in from a foraging expedition i had come to look on mr mcclure's returns as the most genuinely creative moments of our magazine life he was an extraordinary reporter 
his sense of the meaning the meat of a man or event his vivid imagination his necessity of discharging on the group at once before they were cold his observations intuitions ideas experiences made the gatherings on his return amazingly stimulating to me sifting examining verifying following up were all necessary mr mcclure understood that and trusted john phillips to see that it was done but he properly fought for his findings in his autobiography stephens credits me with a tact in our editorial scrimmages which i do not deserve it is true as he says that i was the friend of each and all but what i was chiefly interested in was seeing the magazine grow in delight and in usefulness i knew our excited discussions were really fertile they also were highly entertaining it was in this unsatisfied seeking by mr mcclure for more and more of contemporary life that lincoln stephen's chief contribution to it and to the political life of his period had its root mr mcclure's fixed conviction that great editing was not to be done in the office he finally applied to stephen's who was bravely struggling there to become the great editor he had been called to be you can't learn to edit a magazine in the office mr mcclure told him get out go anywhere everywhere see what is going on in the cities and states find out who are the men and the movements we ought to be reporting and so steph went for a month to the middle west mainly constantly reporting back to the office in mcclure fashion what he was finding he combed the universities in the newspaper offices he looked up politicians he searched for writers anything and everywhere which might possibly be grist to the greedy mill in new york one of the schemes on which he had been commissioned to check up was a series of articles on city and state governments almost at once he began to see larger and larger possibilities in the idea there should be two series he wrote the office descriptions of the actual government of four or five typical cities and of as many states humanized by studies of the men who ruled them or who were fighting the true rulers a meeting with young district attorney folk of st louis then in the thick of a fight to reform his town whetted his appetite if we take up the states he wrote i would prefer to wait for william allen white to write the articles the cities will be more in my line if i should be entrusted with the work i think i could make my name a few weeks later he was entrusted with the work the result was the shame of the cities which as he prophesied made his name end of chapter ten Chapter 11, Part 1 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Captain of Industry Seeks My Acquaintance. As Stephen's case shows, there was always much fingering of a subject at McClure's before one of the staff was told to go ahead. The original hint might come from Mr. McClure's overflowing head and pocket, Mr. Phillips' notebooks, as much a part of him as his glasses, the Daily Mail, the chance word of a caller. We all turned in our pickings. They must concern the life of the day, that which was interesting people. An idea, once launched, grew, until fixed on somebody, and once started it continued to grow, according to the response of readers. No response, no more chapters. A healthy response, as many chapters as the material justified. It was by this process that my next long piece of work came into being, the history of the Standard Oil Company. The deluge of monopolistic trusts, which had followed the close of the Spanish-American War and the return of prosperity, was disturbing and confusing people. It was contrary to their philosophy, their belief that, given free opportunity, free competition, there would always be brains and energy enough to prevent even the ablest leader monopolizing an industry. What was interfering with the free play of the forces in which they trusted? They had been depending on the federal antitrust law, passed ten years before. Was it quite useless? It looked that way, 
there was much talk in the office about it and there came to the top finally the idea of using the story of a typical trust to illustrate how and why the clan grew how about the greatest of them all the standard oil company i suppose i must have talked rather freely about my own recollections and impressions of its development it had been a strong thread weaving itself into the pattern of my life from childhood on i had come into the world just before the discovery of oil the land on which i was born not being over thirty miles away from that first well the discovery had shaped my father's life rescuing him as it did thousands of others from the long depression which had devastated the eighteen fifties i had grown up with oil derricks oil tanks pipelines refineries oil exchanges i remembered what had happened in the oil region in eighteen seventy two when the railroads and an outside group of refiners attempted to seize what many men had created it was my first experience in revolution on the instant the word became holy to me it was your privilege and duty to fight injustice i was much elated when not so long afterwards i fell on rousseau's social contract and read his defense of the right to revolt i had been only dimly conscious of what had happened in the decade following the decade in which the standard oil company had completed its monopoly it was the effect on the people about me that stirred me the hate and suspicion and fear that engulfed the community i had been so deeply stirred by this human tragedy as i have told that i had made a feeble and ineffectual attempt to catch it fix it in a novel the drama continued to unfold while i was abroad came into our very household when a partner of my father's ruined by the complex situation shot himself leaving father with notes to pay them it was necessary in the panic of ninety three to do what in his modest economy was unsound and humiliating mortgage our home while the personal tragedies came in my mother's letters my brother wrote me vivid accounts of what was going on in the outside oil world of the slow action of the interstate commerce commission from which all independents had hoped so much of businesses ruined while they waited for the decision of the ohio suit which drove the trust to reorganization a legal victory which in no way weakened its hold or crippled its growth depressing as this was i was elated by my brother's report of the growing strength of a strongly integrated cooperative effort of producers refiners transporters marketers the pure oil company the only escape possible for those who would do independent business he argued ably was to build their own combination depending less on agitation politics legislation more on sound business fight if necessary but above all do business while i was still in paris this clutter of recollections impressions indignations perplexities was crystallized into something like a pattern by henry d lloyd's brilliant wealth against commonwealth i had been hearing about the book from home but the first copy was brought me by my english friend h wickham steed who fresh from two years contact with german socialism took the work with great seriousness was not this a conclusive proof that capitalism was necessarily inconsistent with fair and just economic life was not socialism the only way out as lloyd thought i was more simple-minded about it as i saw it it was not capitalism but an open disregard of decent ethical business practices by capitalists which lay at the bottom of the story mr lloyd told so dramatically the reading and discussions whetted my appetite and when i came back to america in eighteen ninety four and heard anew in the family circle of what had been going on my old desire to get the drama down seized me where were those notes i had made back in my chautauquan days gathering dust in the tower room i looked them up saw that i had done well in choosing pithole for my opening scene nothing so dramatic as pithole in oil history how many men it had made and ruined 
but the bottom had dropped out in 1866. What was left of it now? 1894. My brother and I drove over to see. Thirty years before, Pithole had been a city of perhaps 20,000 men and women, with all the equipment for a permanent life. Now here were only stripped fields where no outline of a town remained. We spent a long day trying to place the famous wells, to fix my father's tank shops, so profitable while Pithole lasted, to trace the foundations of the Bonta House, which had furnished the makings of our home in Titusville. The day left us with a melancholy sense of the impermanence of human undertakings, and, more to the point, it showed me that, if I were to reconstruct the town with its activities and its people, picture its rise and its fall, I must go back to records, maps, reminiscences, that I must undertake a long and serious piece of investigation before I began. But given the material, how about my ability to make it live, to create the drama which I felt? One must be an artist before he can create. That I knew. I was no artist. Mr. McClure's call to come on and write a life of Napoleon put an end to my hesitations. And, Napoleon done, there had been Lincoln and the Spanish-American War. No time to consider oil, or even to rejoice over the final success of the integrated industry to which my brother had tied his fortune. But here I was, again faced with the old interest. The desire to do something about it, get down what I had seen, seized me. Was it possible to treat the story historically, to make a documented narrative? The more I talked, the more convinced I was that it could be done. But to tell the story so that other people would read it was another matter. Mr. Phillips finally put it up to me to make an outline of what I thought possible. We couldn't go ahead without Mr. McClure's approval, and he was ill, in Europe with all his family. Go over, said John Phillips, show the outline to Sam, get his decision. And so, in the fall of 1890, I went to Lausanne in Switzerland to talk it over with Mr. McClure. A week would do it, I thought, but I hadn't reckoned with the McClure method. Don't worry about it, said he. I want to think it over. Mrs. McClure and you and I will go to Greece for the winter. You've never been there. We can discuss Standard Oil in Greece as well as here. If it seems a good plan, you can send for your documents and work in the Pantheon. And he chuckled at the picture. Almost before I realized it, we were headed for Greece, via the Italian lakes, Milan, and Venice. In Milan, Mr. McClure suddenly decided that he and Mrs. McClure needed a cure before Greece, and headed for the ancient watering place of Salso Maggiore. Here, in the interval of mud baths and steam soaks, and watching such magnificent humans as Cecil Rhodes and his retinue recuperating from their latest South African adventure, we finally came to a decision. I was to go back to New York and see what I could make of the outline I had been expounding. Greece was to be abandoned. Leaving Mr. and Mrs. McClure to finish their cure, I headed for New York to write what as far as title was concerned, certainly looked like a doubtful enterprise for a magazine like McClure's, the history of the Standard Oil Company. McClure's has courage. How often that remark was made after our undertaking was under way. But courage implies a suspicion of danger. Nobody thought of such a thing in our office. We were undertaking what we regarded as a legitimate piece of historical work. We were neither apologists nor critics, only journalists, intent on discovering what had gone into the making of this most perfect of all monopolies. What had we to be afraid of? I soon discovered, however, that if we were not afraid, I must work in a field where numbers of men and women were afraid, believed in the all-seeing eye and the all-powerful reach of the ruler of the oil industry. They believed that anybody going ahead openly with a project in any way objectionable to the Standard Oil Company would meet with direct or indirect attack. Examination of their methods had always been objectionable to them. Go ahead and they will get you in the end, I was told by more than one who had come to that conclusion either from long observation or from long suffering. 
Even my father said, Don't do it, Ida. They will ruin the magazine. It was a persistent fog of suspicion and doubt and fear. From the start, this fog hampered what was my first business, making sure of the documents in the case. I knew they existed. Almost continuously since its organization in 1870, the Standard Oil Company had been under investigation by the Congress of the United States and by the legislatures of various states in which it had operated, on the suspicion that it was receiving rebates from the railroads and was practicing methods in restraint of free trade. In 1872, and again in 1876, it was before congressional committees. In 1879, it was before examiners of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and before committees appointed by the legislatures of New York and Ohio for investigating railroads. Its operations figured constantly in the debate which led up to the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, and again and again since that time the commission had been called upon to examine, directly or indirectly, into its relations with the railroads. In 1888, in the investigation of trusts conducted by Congress and by the State of New York, the Standard Oil Company was the chief subject for examination. In the State of Ohio, between 1882 and 1892, a constant warfare was waged against the Standard in the courts and the legislature, resulting in several volumes of testimony. The legislatures of many other states concerned themselves with it, this hostile legislation compelled the trust to separate into its component parts in 1892, but investigation did not cease. Indeed, in the great industrial inquiry conducted by the commission appointed by President McKinley, the Standard Oil Company was constantly under discussion, and hundreds of pages of testimony on it appear in the 19 volumes of reports which the commission submitted. This mass of testimony most, if not all of it, taken under oath, contained the different charters and agreements under which the Standard Oil Trust had operated, many contracts and agreements with railroads, with refineries, with pipelines, and it contained the experiences in business from 1872 up to 1900 of multitudes of individuals. These experiences had exactly the quality of the personal reminiscences of actors in great events with the additional value that they were given on the witness stand, and it was fair, therefore, to suppose that they were more cautious and exact in statement than are many writers of memoirs. These investigations, covering as they did all of the important steps in the development of the trust, included full accounts of the point of view of its officers in regard to that development, as well as their explanations of many of the operations over which controversy had arisen. Aside from the great mass of sworn testimony accessible to the student, there was a large pamphlet literature dealing with the different phases of the subject, as well as files of the numerous daily newspapers and monthly reviews, supported by the oil region, in the columns of which were to be found not only statistics, but full reports of all controversies between oil men. But the documentary sources were by no means all in print. The Standard Oil Trust and its constituent companies had figured in many civil suits, the testimony of which was in manuscript in the files of the courts where the suits were tried. I had supposed it would be easy to locate the records of the important investigations and cases, but I soon found I had been too trustful. For instance, there was a federal investigation of the South Improvement Company, the first attempt to make a hard and fast alliance between oil-bearing railroads and oil refiners, an alliance which inevitably would kill everybody not admitted, since by the contract the railroads not only allowed the privileged refiners a rebate on all their shipments, but paid them a drawback on those of independence. The railroads also agreed to give them full information about the quantity and the destination of their rival shipments. The Standard Oil Company as a monopoly had grown out of this pretty scheme. Where could I get a copy of that investigation? More than one cynic said, You'll never find one. They have all been destroyed. 
when i had located copies in each of two private collections i was refused permission to put my hands on them to be sure i did by persistent searching find that so guarded investigation in a pamphlet which was one of the three which are all i know to be in existence i am not supposing that there are not others for i quickly learned when i was told that the entire edition of a printed document had been destroyed to go on looking once a document is in print somewhere some time a copy turns up however small the edition for instance there was the important hepburn investigation of the relations of railroads and private industries made by the state of new york in eighteen seventy nine i could not find a copy in the oil region where i was working the standard had destroyed them all i was told at that time there was in the public library of new york city one of the ablest of american bibliographers adelaide haas she had helped me more than once to find a scarce document how about this hepburn investigation i wrote miss haas here in the library for your use whenever you will come around but she added only one hundred copies were ever published it is a scarce piece i have known of a complete set selling for one hundred dollars it was understood at the time she explained that one or two important railroad presidents whose testimony was given before the committee bought up and destroyed as many sets as they could obtain in the end all the printed documents were located but where was the unprinted testimony taken in lawsuits had incriminating testimony been spirited away from the court files henry lloyd made such an accusation in his first edition of wealth against commonwealth it disappeared from a second edition i wrote to ask him why the testimony was put back after my first book appeared he answered i was particularly anxious to have the original of one of these documents but when i came to look for it it was not in the files where was it how was i to locate it and if i did succeed would there be any chance to judge from past experience that it would be turned over to me i saw that i must have an assistant someone preferably in cleveland ohio so many years the headquarters of the standards operations it meant more expense and i was already costing the office an amount which shocked my thrifty practice but mr mcclure and mr phillips being generous and patient and also by this time fairly confident that in the end we should get something worth while told me to go ahead i had learned in my lincoln work that an assistant even if faithful and hard-working may be an encumbrance when it comes to investigation it needs more than accuracy it needs enthusiasm for finding out things solving puzzles anybody's puzzles i wanted a young man with college training a year or two of experience as a reporter intelligent energetic curious convinced everything he was asked to do was important even if he did not at the moment know why he must get his fun in the chase you in the bag also he must be trusted to keep his mouth shut i can recommend the technique i practiced in this case for finding my rare bird from each of three different editors in cleveland i asked the name of a young man whom he thought competent to run down a not very important looking bit of information to each of the names given me i wrote instructions from new york i would be around soon to pick up the report i told them adding that i should prefer that he say nothing about the assignment when i went to cleveland to view my prospects i found both number one and number two fine intelligent fellows their reports were excellent but they had not the least interest in what they had done i thanked them paid them and said good day the third young man came short and plump his eyes glowing with excitement he sat on the edge of his chair as i watched him i had a sudden feeling of alarm lest he should burst out of his clothes i never had the same feeling about any other individual except theodore roosevelt i once watched the first roosevelt through a white house musicale when i felt his clothes might not contain him he was so steamed up so ready to go attack anything anywhere the young man gave me his report but what counted was the way he had gone after his material 
his curiosity his conviction that it was important since i wanted it i thought i had my man a few more trials convinced me that john m siddle was a find he at that time was an associate of frank bray in the editing of the chautauquan the headquarters of which had been shifted to cleveland from meadville when siddle once understood what i was up to he jumped at the chance went to work with a will and stayed working with a will until the task was ended he was a continuous joy as well as a support in my undertaking nothing better in the way of letter writing came to the mcclure's office in time everybody was reading siddle's letters to me whether it was a mere matter of statistics or a matter of the daily life in cleveland of john d rockefeller the head of the standard oil company if anything in or around ohio interested the magazine the office immediately suggested ask sid and sid always found the answer mr mcclure and mr phillips began to say we want sid as soon as you are through with him sid saw the opportunity and as soon as i could spare him in ohio he joined the mcclure's staff i had been at work a year gathering and sifting materials before the series was announced very soon after that mr mcclure dashed into the office one day to tell me he had just been talking with mark twain who said his friend henry rogers at that time the most conspicuous man in the standard oil group had asked him to find out what kind of history of the concern mcclure's proposed to publish you will have to ask miss tarbell mr mcclure told him would miss tarbell see mr rogers mark twain asked mr mcclure was sure i would not ask anything better which was quite true and so an interview was arranged for one day early in january of nineteen o two at mr rogers home then at twenty six east fifty seventh street i was a bit scared at the idea i had met many kinds of people but this was my first high-ranking captain of industry was i putting my head into a lion's mouth i did not think so it had become more and more evident to me that any attempt to bite our heads off would be the stupidest thing the standard oil company could do its reputation being what it was it was not that stupid i told myself however it was one thing to tackle the standard oil company in documents as i had been doing quite another thing to meet it face to face and then would mr rogers come across could i talk with him so far my attempts to talk with members of the organization had been failures i had been met with that formulated chatter used by those who have accepted a creed a situation a system to baffle the investigator trying to find out what it all means my nervousness and my skepticism fell away when mr rogers stepped forward in his library to greet me he was frank and hearty plainly he wanted me to be at ease in that way he knew that he could soon tell whether it was worth his while to spend further time on me or not henry rogers was a man of about sixty at this time a striking figure by all odds the handsomest and most distinguished figure in wall street he was tall muscular lithe as an indian there was a trace of the early oil adventure in his bearing in spite of his air of authority his excellent grooming his manner of the quick-witted naturally adaptable man who has seen much of people his big head with its high forehead was set off by a heavy shock of beautiful gray hair his nose was aquiline sensitive the mouth which i fancy must have been flexible capable both of firm decision and of gay laughter was concealed by a white drooping moustache his eyes were large and dark narrowed a little by caution capable of blazing as i was to find out shaded by heavy gray eyebrows giving distinction and force to his face i remember thinking as i tried to get my bearings now i understand why mark twain likes him so much they are alike even in appearance they have the bond of early similar experiences mark twain in nevada henry rogers in the early oil regions when and where did your interest in oil begin mr rogers asked as he seated me a full light on my face i noticed on the flats and hills of rouseville i told him of course he cried of course tarbell's tank shops 
I knew your father. I could put my finger on the spot where those shops stood. We were off. We forgot our serious business and talked of our early days on the creek. Mr. Rogers told me how the news of the oil excitement had drawn him from his boyhood home in New England, how he had found his way into Rouseville, gone into refining. He had married and put his first thousand dollars into a home on the hillside adjoining ours. It was a little white house, he said, with a high peaked roof. Oh, I remember it, I cried. The prettiest house in the world, I thought it. It was my first approach to the Gothic arch, my first recognition of beauty in a building. We reconstructed the geography of our neighborhood, lingering over the charm of the narrow ravine which separated our hillsides, a path on each side. Up that path, Mr. Rogers told me, I used to carry our washing every Monday morning and go for it every Saturday night. Probably I've seen you hunting flowers on your side of the ravine. How beautiful it was. I was never happier. Could two strangers, each a little wary of the other, have had a more auspicious beginning for a serious talk? For what followed was serious, with moments of strain. What are you basing your story on? he asked finally. On documents. I am beginning with the South Improvement Company. He broke in to say, well, that, of course, was an outrageous business. That is where the Rockefellers made their big mistake. I knew, of course, that Mr. Rogers had fought that early raid tooth and nail. And I also knew that later he had joined the conspirators, as the oil region called them, in carrying out, point by point, the initial program. But I did not throw it up to him. Why did you not come to us at the start? Mr. Rogers asked. It was unnecessary. You have written your history. Besides, it would have been quite useless, I told him. We've changed our policy, he said. We are giving out information. As a matter of fact, Mr. Rogers may be regarded, I think, as the first public relations counsel of the Standard Oil Company, the forerunner of Ivy Lee. And I was, so far as I know, the first subject on which the new policy was tried. In the close to two hours I spent that afternoon with Henry Rogers, we went over the history of the oil business. We talked of rebates and pipelines, independent struggles and failures, the absorption of everything that touched their ambition. He put their side to me, the mightiness of their achievement, the perfection of their service. Also he talked of their trials, the persecution, as he called it, by their rivals, the attack of Lloyd. I never understood how Harper could have published that book. Why, I knew Harry Harper socially. There has always been something, he said, a little ruefully. Look at things now, Russia and Texas. There seems to be no end of the oil they have there. How can we control it? It looks as if something had the Standard Oil Company by the neck, something bigger than we are. The more we talked, the more at home I felt with him, and the more I liked him. It was almost like talking with Mr. McClure and Mr. Phillips. Finally, we made a compact. I was to take up with him each case in their history as I came to it. He was to give me documents, figures, explanations, and justifications, anything and everything which could enlarge my understanding and judgment. I realized how big a contribution he would make if he continued to be as frank as he was in this preliminary talk. I made it quite clear to him, however, that while I should welcome anything in the way of information and explanation that he could give, it must be my judgment, not his, which prevailed. Of course, Mr. Rogers, I told him, I realize that my judgments may not stand in the long run, but I shall have to stand or fall by them. Well, he said as I rose to go, I suppose we'll have to stand it. Would you be willing to come to my office for these talks? It might be a little more convenient. Certainly, I replied. He looked a bit surprised. Will you talk with Mr. Rockefeller? Certainly, I said. Well, he said a little doubtfully, I'll try to arrange it. For two years our bargain was faithfully kept, I usually going to his office at 26 Broadway. That in itself, at the start, for one as unfamiliar as I was with the scenes and customs of big business, was an adventure. 
my entrance and exit to mr rogers's office were carried on with a secrecy which never failed to amuse me the alert handsome business-like little chaps who received me at the entrance to the rogers suite piloted me unerringly by a route where nobody saw me and i saw nobody into some small room opening on to a court and it seemed never the same route i was not slow in discovering that across the court in the window directly opposite there was always stationed a gentleman whose head seemed to be turned my way whenever i looked across it may have meant nothing at all i only record the fact the only person besides mr rogers i ever met in those offices was his private secretary miss harrison a woman spoken of with awe at that date as having a ten thousand dollar salary one who knew her employer's business from a to z and whom he could trust absolutely she radiated efficiency business competency along with her competency went that gleam of hardness which efficient business women rarely escape miss harrison appeared only on rare occasions when an extra document was needed she was as impersonal as the chairs in the room we discussed in these interviews with entire frankness the laws which they had flouted i could not shock mr rogers with records not even when i confronted him one day with the testimony he had given on a certain point which he admitted was not according to the facts he curtly dismissed the subject they had no business prying into my private affairs as for rebates somebody would have taken them if we had not but with your strength mr rogers i argued you could have forced fair play on the railroads and on your competitors ah he said but there was always somebody without scruples in competition however small that somebody might be he might grow there it was the obsession of the standard oil company that danger lurked in small as well as great things that nothing however trivial must live outside of its control these talks made me understand as i could not from the documents themselves the personal point of view of independence like mr rogers who had been gathered into the organization in the first decade of monopoly making for instance there was mr rogers reason for desiring the trust agreement made in eighteen eighty two by eighteen eighty said mr rogers i had stock in nearly all of the seventy or so companies which we had absorbed but the real status of these companies was not known to the public in case of my death there would have been practically no buyer except mr flagler mr rockefeller and a few others on the inside my heirs would not have reaped the benefit of my holdings the trust agreement changed this the public at once realized the value of the trust certificate that is my estate was guarded in case of my death he often emphasized the part economies had played not only in building up the concern but in their individual fortunes economies in putting their money back into the business we lived in rented houses and saved money to buy stock in the company he told me once only one who remembers as i do the important place that owning your own home took in the personal economy of the self-respecting individual of that day can feel the force of this explanation i was curious about how he had been able to adjust his well-known passion for speculation with mr rockefeller's well-known antagonism to all forms of gambling didn't he object i asked oh he said a little ruefully i was never a favorite i suppose i was a born gambler in the early days of the charles pratt company the company of which i was a member i always carried on the speculations for the concern mr pratt said henry i haven't got the nerve to speculate i kicked all the clothes off last night worrying about the market give me the money i told him and i will furnish the nerve we simply raked in the money making a gesture with both hands and of course it came out of the producer that is what my father always said i told him one of the severest lectures he ever gave came from one of those booms in the market which sent everybody in the oil region crazy i suppose you were responsible for it i remember a day when the schools were practically closed because 
all the teachers in titusville were on the street or in the oil exchange everybody speculating i was in high school the fever caught me and i asked father for one hundred dollars to try my luck in the market he was as angry with me as i ever saw him no daughter of mine he said etc etc wise man mr rogers commented but it was not because he was so cautious i said it was because he thought it morally wrong he would no more have speculated in the stock market than he would have played poker for money i always play poker when the market is closed commented mr rogers i can't help it saturday afternoons i almost always make up a poker party and every now and then john gates and i rig up something he'll come around and say henry isn't it about time we started something we usually do all of these talks were informal natural we even argued with entire friendliness the debatable question what is the worst thing the standard oil company ever did only now and then did one of us flare and then the other generally changed the subject he's a liar and a hypocrite and you know it i exploded one day when we were talking of a man who had led in what to me was a particularly odious operation i think it is going to rain said mr rogers looking out of the window with ostentatious detachment End of chapter 11, part 1chapter eleven part two of all in the day's work by ida tarbell the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain a captain of industry seeks my acquaintance mr rogers not only produced documents and arguments he produced people with whom i wanted to talk the most important was henry flagler who had been in on the south improvement company that early deal with the railroads which had started the standard oil company off on the road to monopoly there had always been a controversy as to who had suggested that fine scheme mr flagler was in it what did he know mr rogers arranged that i talk with him henry flagler was not an acceptable figure even to wall street in those days there were scandals of his private life which true or not his fellow financiers did not like bad for business i found him a very different type from henry rogers he for instance did not conceal his distrust of john rockefeller he would do me out of a dollar to-day he cried off his guard and with an excited smash of his fist on the table and then catching himself and with a remarkable change of tone that is if he could do it honestly miss tarbell if he could do it honestly mr flagler knew what i had come for but instead of answering my direct questions he began to tell me with some show of emotion of his own early life how he had left home because his father was a poor clergyman four hundred dollars a year a large family of children he had not succeeded until he went into the commission business with mr rockefeller in cleveland and from that time we were prospered he said piously in the long story he told me the phrase we were prospered came in again and again that was not what i was after their prosperity was obvious enough finally i returned with some irritation to the object of my visit i see you do not know or are unwilling to say mr flagler who originated the south improvement company but this is certain mr rockefeller had the credit of it in the oil region you know yourself how bitter the feeling was there but ah miss tarbell he said how often the reputation of a man in his lifetime differs from his real character take the greatest character in our history how different was our lord and saviour regarded when he was alive from what we now know him to have been after that further questioning was of course hopeless and until mr rogers returned i sat listening to the story of how the lord had prospered him i was never happier to leave a room but i was no happier than mr flagler was to have me go mr rogers produced mr flagler and others of lesser importance but although i referred to his semi-promise in our first interview to produce mr rockefeller i found that after a few months there was no hope of this 
if i hinted at it he parried nearly a year went by after my first interview with mr rogers before the articles began to appear i rather expected him to cut me off when he realized that i was trying to prove that the standard oil company was only an enlarged south improvement company but to my surprise my arguments did not seem to disturb him they had won out had they not he sometimes complained that i had been unnecessarily blunt or a bit vindictive but he continued to receive me in friendly fashion and to give me perhaps not all the help he might but always something to make me think twice frequently to modify a view but if he was not himself disturbed by what i was doing why did he continue the interviews gradually i became convinced it was because of his interest in my presentation of a particular episode in their history it was a case in which mr rogers and john archbold along with all of the members of the board of a subsidiary company the vacuum oil company of rochester new york had been indicted for conspiring to destroy an independent refinery in buffalo new york in my opening interview with mr rogers he with some show of feeling had told me he wanted me to get a correct and impartial version of this buffalo case as he always called it there had been a break in his voice when with hesitation he said that case is a sore point with mr archbold and me i want you to go into it thoroughly i have the reports of the testimony before the grand jury it took me months to secure them of course in a sense i have no right with them i told my children that if their father's memory is ever attacked this will serve to vindicate him he must stand or fall in their estimation by that testimony at our second interview he produced the testimony before the grand jury repeating again that of course he had no business with it but he had to have it he would not allow me to take it away and at his request i read the sixty or more pages in his presence it seemed quite clear to me as i told mr rogers on finishing the reading that his connection with the affair had been so indirect that there was no reason for his indictment although it seemed equally clear to me that there was ample reason for the indictment of certain members of the vacuum board the judge was of that opinion for he dismissed the indictment against mr rogers and two of his fellow directors while sustaining that against the responsible operating heads of the concern i soon discovered that what mr rogers wanted me to make out was that the three men who had founded the independent enterprise all of them former employees of the vacuum oil company had done so for the sole purpose of forcing the standard to buy them out at a high price that is that it was a case of planned blackmail but the testimony certainly showed little evidence of that while it did show clearly enough that the managers of the vacuum oil company from the hour they had learned of the undertaking had made deliberate and open attempts to prevent the buffalo refinery doing business the more thoroughly i went into the matter and i worked hard over it the more convinced i was that while there had been bad faith and various questionable practices on the part of members of the independent firm they had started out to build up a business of their own also it was clear they had had hardly a shadow of success under the grilling opposition of the standard concern this included various suits for infringement of patents all of which the standard had lost in the course of the years of litigation four juries two grand juries and two petty juries gave verdicts against the standard oil company finally the independent concern was so shot to pieces by the continuous bombardment that it had to be put into the hands of a receiver the standard offered to settle for eighty five thousand dollars and the judge ordered the acceptance this made it the owner of the bone of contention i had a feeling that my final conclusion in the matter would probably end my relations with mr rogers i did not want to spring that conclusion on him that is i wanted him to know ahead of publication where i had come out although i had never allowed him to read an article before its appearance that being part of the original compact i broke my rule in this case promptly i received a letter asking me to call at twenty six broadway he received me in his usual cordial way and told me he had gone over my article carefully 
compared it with certain papers in his possession and had written me a letter in which he had stated his criticisms handing me the letter he said i think it will be a good plan for you to read that out loud so that we can talk it over here i began to read but broke off with the first sentence mr rogers had written that he appreciated my request that he should make the story correspond with his knowledge and opinion of the case mr rogers i said if you will look at my letter you will see that i did not suggest that you make the article correspond with your opinion of the case i am convinced that i cannot do that i asked you to examine the article and see if i had made any errors in statement or had omitted any essential testimony on either side he smiled never mind go ahead he said the letter was admirable almost every point well taken there was nothing which it was not proper for me to consider at least and with certain of his points i said at once that i was willing to comply the discussion of the letter finished i inwardly breathed a sigh of satisfaction we were going to part on friendly terms with neither of us having yielded our convictions but i had not counted on the resources of henry rogers in a matter in which he was deeply concerned particularly one which touched his personal pride and aroused his fighting spirit for as i was about to go he sprang on me an entirely new interpretation of the case not only was the suit of the independent refinery in which he had been indicted a continuation of the original blackmailing scheme but the lawyers in the case had themselves been in the conspiracy he laid before me a number of documents which he claimed proved it the chief of these was the itemized report of the receiver this report he said showed that the lawyers had taken the case knowing that if the buffalo concern did not win there would be no fees and showed them that when the matter had finally been settled they had made what the receiver considered exorbitant claims for their services there were five of them and they finally were allowed some thirty thousand dollars you can see mr rogers said as he pointed out these facts why they were so eager to convict us they were making a raid on the standard and the bench was with them his charge that the bench was with them he based on the fact that two of the lawyers originally in the case had later been elevated to the bench they had not of course heard the case but they had put their information and conclusions at the disposal of their successors i was startled by this sudden and sinister accusation and sat for some time with my head bent over the papers forgetting his presence trying to get at the meaning of the documents was there any other explanation than that which mr rogers had given me with such conviction looking up suddenly for the first time in my experience with mr rogers i caught him looking at me with narrowed and cunning eyes i took alarm on the instant we are not the only ones you see miss tarbell if this means what it seems to mean you are not but i shall have to study these documents mr rogers i shall have to consult a lawyer about the practice common in such cases that will be all right he said he was more exultant than i had ever found him i knew that paper would come in well some day to get it i consented to our people buying the buffalo refinery we did not want it but i wanted to get the receiver's reports and know just what had been done with the money we had paid them on the whole i had never seen him better pleased with himself than he was at that moment his satisfaction was so great that for the first time in our acquaintance he gave me a little lecture for a caustic remark i had made that is not a christian remark he said i contended that it was a perfect expression of my notion of a christian you ought to go to church more frequently he said why don't you come and hear my pastor dr savage we parted on good terms after a discussion of our religious views and church-going practices and he gave me a cordial invitation to come back which i agreed to do as soon as i had studied the new angle in the buffalo case aided by a disinterested and fair-minded lawyer i gave a thorough study to the documents but do my best i could not convince myself that mr rogers contention was sound it is not an unusual thing for lawyers to take cases they believe in knowing that their compensation depends on their winning 
many clients with just cases would be deprived of counsel if they had to ensure a fixed compensation for not infrequently as in the buffalo case all that a client has is involved in a suit the practice is so common among reputable lawyers that it certainly cannot be regarded as a proof of a conspiracy unless there is a reason to suppose that they have taken a case of whose merits they themselves are suspicious there was no evidence that the counsel of the independent concern was not convinced from the first that they had a strong case their claims were large but lawyers are not proverbial for their modesty of their charges and besides exorbitant charges can hardly be construed as a proof of conspiracy when i finally had written out my conclusion i sent a copy of it to mr rogers saying i should be glad to talk it over with him if he wished he did wish wrote me that he had new material to present but before the date set for the meeting an article in our series was published which broke off our friendly relations in studying the testimony of independence over a period of some thirty years i had found repeated complaints that their oil shipments were interfered with their cars sidetracked en route while pressure was brought on buyers to cancel orders there were frequent charges that freight clerks were reporting independent shipments i did not take the matter seriously at first the general suspicion of standard dealings by independence had to be taken into consideration i told myself then too i was willing to admit that a certain amount of attention to what your competitor is doing is considered legitimate business practice i knew that in the office of mcclure's magazine we were very keen to know what other publishers were doing and too there is the overzealous and unscrupulous employee who in the name of competition recognizes no rules for his game but the charges continued to multiply i met them in testimony and i met them in interviews there was no escaping espionage men told me they know where we send every barrel of oil half the time our oil never reaches its destination i could scarcely believe it and then unexpectedly there came to my desk a mass of incontrovertible proofs that what i had been hearing was true and more as a matter of fact this system of following up independent oil shipments was letter perfect so perfect that it was made a matter of office bookkeeping it looks sometimes mr rogers had said to me as if something had the standard oil company by the neck something bigger than we are in this case the something bigger was a boy's conscience a lad of sixteen or seventeen in the office of a standard plant had as one of his regular monthly duties the burning of large quantities of records he had carried out his orders for many months without attention to the content then suddenly his eyes fell one night on the name of a man who had been his friend since childhood had even been his sunday school teacher an independent oil refiner in the city a standard competitor the boy began to take notice he discovered that the name appeared repeatedly on different forms and in the letters which he was destroying it made him uneasy and he began to piece the records together it was not long before he saw to his distress that the concern for which he was working was getting from the railroad offices of the town full information about every shipment that his friend was making moreover that the office was writing to its representative in the territory to which the independent oil was going stop that shipment get that trade and the correspondence showed how both were done what was a youth to do under such circumstances he didn't do anything at first but finally when he could not sleep nights for thinking about it he gathered up a full set of documents and secretly took them to his friend now this particular oil refiner had been reading the mcclure's articles he had become convinced that i was trying to deal fairly with the matter he had also convinced himself in some way that i was to be trusted so one night he brought me the full set of incriminating documents there was no doubt about their genuineness the most interesting to me was the way they fitted in with the testimony scattered through the investigations and lawsuits here were bookkeeping records explaining every accusation that had been made but how could i use them 
together we worked out a plan by which the various forms and blanks could be reproduced with fictitious names of persons and places substituted for the originals it was after this material had come to my hands that i took the subject up with mr rogers the original south improvement company formula mr rogers provided for reports of independent shipments from the railroads i have come on repeated charges that the practice continues what about it do you follow independent shipments do you stop them do you have the help of railroad shipping clerks in the operation of course we do everything we legally and fairly can to find out what our competitors are doing just as you do in mcclure's magazine mr rogers answered but as for any such system of tracking and stopping as you suggest that is nonsense how could we do it even if we would well i said give me everything you have on this point he said he had nothing more than what he had already told me as i have said the article came out just before i was to see mr rogers on what i hoped would be the last of the buffalo case the only time in all my relations with him when i saw his face white with rage was when i met the appointment he had made our interview was short where did you get that stuff he said angrily pointing to the magazine on the table all i could say was in substance mr rogers you can't for a moment think that i would tell you where i got it you will recall my efforts to get from you anything more than a general denial that these practices of espionage so long complained of were untrue could be explained by legitimate competition you know this bookkeeping record is true there were a few curt exchanges about other points in the material but nothing as i now recall on the buffalo case the article ended my visits to twenty six broadway nearly four years passed before i saw henry rogers and in that period exciting and tragic events had come his way there was the copper war he and his friends had attempted to build up a monopoly in copper to match that of the standard oil company in petroleum the amalgamated copper company a youngster f augustus hines had come into montana and by bold and ruthless operation put together a copper company of his own the two organizations were soon at each other's throats it was a business war without a vestige of decency one in which every devious device of the law and of politics was resorted to by both sides but mr rogers had other troubles he and his friends had been engaged in organizing the gas interests of the east they had engineered stock raids which had been as disastrous to wall street as to gambling main street such operations in the past had never cost him more than a passing angry comment by the public press now however came something damaging to his reputation and his pride it was a series of lurid articles by a bold and very much on the inside broker and speculator thomas lawson of boston for nearly two years lawson published monthly in everybody's magazine under the admirable title frenzied finance circumstantial accounts of the speculation of the rogers group and what they had cost their dupes that story cut mr rogers pride to the quick he is said to have threatened the american news company with destruction if it circulated the magazine taken altogether the excitement and anger were too much for even his iron frame and indomitable spirit and in the summer of nineteen o seven he suffered a stroke which put him out of the fight for many weeks when he came back it was at once to collide with the government suit against the standard oil company and soon after that with the rich man's panic of nineteen o seven a panic for which his old enemy in copper f augustus hines was largely responsible early in november when the panic was still raiding the banks and the millionaires of the country i stood one day at a corner on fifth avenue waiting for the traffic to clear suddenly i saw an arm waving to me from a slowly passing open automobile and there was h h rogers smiling at me in the friendliest way when i reported the encounter at the office mr phillips at once said why not try to see him if he'll talk about what is going on what a story he could tell but would he see me i was a little dubious about trying 
still the greeting and the smile seemed to mean that at least he harbored no ill will suppose i said he is sufficiently subdued to go over with me his exciting life what a document of big business in the eighties and nineties he could produce if he would put down his recollections with the frankness with which he had sometimes talked to me it seemed worth trying for and i asked for an appointment i had not made a mistake mr rogers was harboring no ill will i was promptly invited to come to his house he greeted me heartily i found him physically changed stouter less sinewy but quite as frank as ever he told me of his stroke he spoke bitterly of what he called the roosevelt panic as well as of roosevelt's interference with the business of the standard oil company he gave me my cue when he began to talk about the early days of the oil region there is a whole chapter he said that has not been written that from fifty nine to seventy two we were getting on swimmingly when our interview was cut short by a card handed him joseph seep the head of the standard oil purchasing agency it amused him greatly that mr seep should have come in while i was there now you'll have to go he said and he put me out by a circuitous route as at twenty six broadway callers were not to see one another as we came into a dark hall he turned on the light you see we have to economize now he said laughingly our good-bye was cordial we'll talk about this again he said call up miss harrison in a week or ten days and we'll make an appointment the appointment was never made the coming months were too difficult for mr rogers his vast business affairs continued complicated the legend of his invincibility in the market was weakened moreover such was the bitterness of the standard oil company over the government suit that i doubt if he or his associates would have considered it wise for him to talk to me they probably thought he had talked already too much to too little purpose they and he probably never understood how much he had done to make me realize the legitimate greatness of the standard oil company how much he had done to make me understand better the vastness and complexity of its problems and the amazing grasp with which it dealt with them their complaint against me mr rogers complaint was that i had never been able to submerge my contempt for their illegitimate practices in my admiration for their genius in organization the boldness of their imagination and execution but my contempt had increased rather than diminished as i worked i never had an animus against their size and wealth never objected to their corporate form i was willing that they should combine and grow as big and rich as they could but only by legitimate means but they had never played fair and that ruined their greatness for me i am convinced that their brilliant example has contributed not only to a weakening of the country's moral standards but to its economic unsoundness the experience of the last decade particularly seems to me to amply justify my conviction i was never to see mr rogers again for in may of nineteen o nine he suddenly died two years before the supreme court dissolved the standard oil company End of chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 12 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Muckraker or Historian. It was inevitable that my visits to 26 Broadway should be noised among critics and enemies of the Standard Oil Company curious about what McClure's was going to do it was not infrequent for someone on the independent side to say with a wise nod of the head oh they'll get around you you'll become their apologist before you get through it was quite useless for me to insist that i was trying to be nobody's apologist that i was trying to balance what i found at least two people of importance whose experiences i was anxious to hear from their own lips refused to see me i learned later that henry d lloyd had written them after he learned i was seeing mr rogers that they had better not talk better not show me their papers that inevitably i should be taken in now i had already talked with mr lloyd already had help from him but the rogers association evidently upset him for a time 
my first article seemed to reassure him for he wrote me at once on its appearance i read your first instalment of the story of the standard oil company with eager curiosity then intense interest and then great satisfaction he seems to have divined at once where i was heading the suspicion of my relations with twenty six broadway cut me off for some two years from one of the most interesting independent warriors in the thirty year struggle this was one lewis emery jr whom i had known from childhood he had grown up in the oil business side by side with h h rogers he had been a producer and a refiner as well as one of the powerful factors in building up the pure oil company the integrated concern in which my brother was carrying on from the start mr emery had fought the standard's pretensions individually and collectively politically and financially he had a gift for language a marvellous vituperative vocabulary and he had no restraint in using it he was a feature of almost every investigation every lawsuit a member of every combination of producers and refiners where he was there were sure to be lively exchanges between him and the representatives of the other side his particular abomination was john archbold vice president of the standard oil company a person as free with charges and epithets as lewis emery himself you are a liar he shouted one day in an investigation when mr emery had made an exaggerated charge joseph h choate was mr archbold's lawyer there there mr archbold he said we'll put mr emery on the stand and convict him of perjury without noticing mr choate's remark mr emery called across the table young man if this table wasn't so wide i would tweak your nose for that such exchanges were not infrequent henry rogers who really liked lewis emery was always trying to calm him down can't you stop this lou he said one day come with us and it will be better for you there is no hope for you alone but with us there is a sure thing mr emery who told me of this offer said henry i can't do it even if i wanted to they would mob me in the oil region if i went back on them they would not have mobbed him but they would have done what would have been worse for a man of his temperament his passion for free action whether wise or unwise they would have ostracized him the most tragic effect i had seen in my girlhood of going over to the standard as it was called was partial ostracism of the renegade when a man's old associates crossed to the other side of the street rather than meet him when nobody stopped him on the street corner to gossip over what was going on few men were calloused enough not to suffer it was worse than mobbing the oil region as a matter of fact never mobbed any man so far as i know though it did occasionally destroy property and once at least hung mr rockefeller himself in effigy by this time lewis emery had fought his way to a substantial position in the oil world but to the end he prided himself on being a victim when he finally talked to me after he learned from mr lloyd that the embargo against me had been raised he said with what seemed to me considerable satisfaction i have been tortured i am a wounded man because of them and i hate them in spite of this he was getting a good deal out of life he was a rich man and he was making the most of his money he never let money stifle his personality his success in being himself was in striking contrast to that of most of the successful oil men of that day whom i knew most of them independent and standard submitted to an application of veneer a change of habits which destroyed much of their natural flavor they took little part in politics and social agitation they remained regular in all things they made their investments only in sure enterprises you always knew where to find them but not so lewis emery jr he continued to wear his clothes naturally to go his own erratic way he threw himself into political movements wise and unwise and he never lost his pioneering spirit after he was seventy years old as a final fling he took on a gold mine in peru a gold mine which was reached by climbing mountains and descending narrow paths cut out of rock crossing swaying rope bridges approaches fit only for the most daring mountain climbers 
yet there he was when nearly eighty charging up and down those mountains and trotting his mule across those bridges when younger men led their mules and crept the degree to which he was reconciled to me after two years of ostracism was proved by his annual invitation to come along to peru with his party and i would have gone and told the story of his mine as he wanted me to do if it had not been for the pictures he sent me those pictures of unprotected swaying bridges suspended from mountainside to mountainside hundreds of feet above the rushing rocky streams i had not the head for that and so gave up what would have been i am sure one of the most amusing adventures that ever came my way not a few of the personal experiences in gathering my materials left me with unhappy impressions more unhappy in retrospect perhaps than they were at the moment they were part of the day's work sometimes very exciting parts there was the two hours i spent in studying mr john d rockefeller as the work had gone on it became more and more clear to me that the standard oil company was his creation an institution is the lengthened shadow of one man says emerson i found it so everybody in the office interested in the work began to say after the book is done you must do a character sketch of mr rockefeller i was not keen for it it would have to be done like the books from documents that is i had no inclination to use the extraordinary gossip which came to me from many sources if i were to do it i wanted only that of which i felt sure i had proof only those things which seemed to me to help explain the public life of this powerful patient secretive calculating man of so peculiar and special a genius you must at least look at mr rockefeller my associates insisted but how mr rogers himself had suggested that i see him i had consented i had returned to the suggestion several times but at last was made to understand that it could not be done i had dropped his name from my list it was john siddle who then took the matter in hand you must see him was siddle's judgment to arrange it became almost an obsession and then what seemed to him like a providential opening came it was announced that on a certain sunday of october nineteen o three mr rockefeller before leaving cleveland where he had spent his summer for his home in new york would say good-bye in a little talk to the sunday school of his church a rally it was called as soon as siddle learned of this he begged me to come on we can go to sunday school we can stay to church i will see that we have seats where we have a full view of the man you will get him in action of course i went feeling a little mean about it too he had not wanted to be seen apparently it was taking him unaware siddle's plan worked to perfection worked so well from the start that again and again he seemed ready to burst from excitement in the two hours we spent in the church we had gone early to the sunday school room where the rally was to open a dismal room with a barbaric dark green paper with big gold designs cheap stained glass windows awkward gas fixtures comfortable of course but so stupidly ugly we were sitting meekly at one side when i was suddenly aware of a striking figure standing in the doorway there was an awful age in his face the oldest man i had ever seen i thought but what power at that moment siddle poked me violently in the ribs and hissed there he is the impression of power deepened when mr rockefeller took off his coat and hat put on a skull-cap and took a seat commanding the entire room his back to the wall it was the head which riveted attention it was big great breadth from back to front high broad forehead big bumps behind the ears not a shiny head but with a wet look the skin was as fresh as that of any healthy man about us the thin sharp nose was like a thorn there were no lips the mouth looked as if the teeth were all shut hard deep furrows ran down each side of the mouth from the nose there were puffs under the little colourless eyes with creases running from them 
wonder over the head was almost at once diverted to wonder over the man's uneasiness his eyes were never quiet but darted from face to face even peering around the jog at the audience close to the wall when he rose to speak the impression of power that the first look at him had given increased and the impression of age passed i expected a quavering voice but the voice was not even old if a little fatigued a little thin it was clear and utterly sincere he meant what he was saying he was on his own ground talking about dividends dividends of righteousness if you would take something out he said clenching the hand of his outstretched right arm you must put something in emphasizing put something in with a long outstretched forefinger the talk over we slipped out to get a good seat in the gallery a seat where we could look full on what we knew to be the rockefeller pew mr rockefeller came into the auditorium of the church as soon as sunday school was out he sat a little bent in his pew pitifully uneasy his head constantly turning to the farthest right or left his eyes searching the faces almost invariably turned towards him it was plain that he and not the minister was the pivot on which that audience swung probably he knew practically everybody in the congregation but now and then he lingered on a face peering at it intently as if he were seeking what was in the mind behind it he looked frequently at the gallery was it at siddle and me the service is over he became the friendly patron saint of the flock coming down the aisle where people were passing out he shook hands with everyone who stopped saying a good sermon the doctor gave us a good sermon it was a very good sermon wasn't it my two hours study of mr rockefeller aroused a feeling i had not expected which time has intensified i was sorry for him i know no companion so terrible as fear mr rockefeller for all the conscious power written in face and voice and figure was afraid i told myself afraid of his own kind my friend lewis emory jr priding himself on being a victim was free and happy not gold enough in the world to tempt him to exchange his love of defiance for a power which carried with it a head as uneasy as that on mr rockefeller's shoulders my unhappiness was increased as the months went by with the multiplying of tales of grievances coming from every direction i made a practice of looking into them all as far as i could and while frequently i found solid reasons for the complaints frequently i found the basic motives behind them suspicion hunger for notoriety blackmail revenge the most unhappy and most unnatural of these grievances came to me from literally the last person in the world to whom i should have looked for information frank rockefeller brother of john d rockefeller frank rockefeller sent word to me by a circuitous route that he had documents in a case which he thought ought to be made public and that if i would secretly come to him in his office in cleveland he would give them to me i knew that there had been a quarrel over property between the two men it made much noise at the time eighteen ninety three had gone to the courts had caused bitterness inside the family itself but because it was a family affair i had not felt that i wanted to touch it but here it was laid on my desk so i went to cleveland where john siddle had a grand opportunity to play the role of sleuth which he so enjoyed his problem being to get me into mr rockefeller's office without anybody suspecting my identity he succeeded i found mr rockefeller excited and vindictive he accused his brother of robbing his word him and his partner james corrigan of all their considerable holdings of stock in the standard oil company the bare facts were that frank rockefeller and james corrigan had been interested in the early standard oil operations in cleveland and had each acquired then a substantial block of stock later they had developed a shipping business on the lakes iron and steel furnaces in cleveland in the eighties they had borrowed money from john d rockefeller putting up their standard oil stock as collateral 
then came the panic of ninety three and they could not meet their obligations in the middle of their distress john rockefeller had foreclosed taking over their stocks leaving them so they charged no time in which to turn around although they felt certain that they would be able a little later out of the substantial business they claimed they had built up to pay their debt to him their future success proved they could have done so i could see john rockefeller's point as i talked with his brother frank frank rockefeller was an open-handed generous trader more interested in the game than in the money to be made he loved good horses raised them i believe on a farm out in kansas he liked gaiety free spending from his brother john's point of view he was not a safe man to handle money he did not reverence it he used it in frivolous ways of which his brother did not approve so it was as a kind of obligation to the sacredness of money that john rockefeller had foreclosed on his own brother and his early friend james corrigan he was strictly within his legal rights and within what i suppose he called his moral right but the transaction left a bitterness in frank rockefeller's heart and mind which was one of the ugliest things i have ever seen i have taken up my children from the rockefeller family lot or shall take up i do not know now which it was they shall not lie in the same enclosure with john d rockefeller the documents in this case, which I later analyzed for the character sketch on which we had decided, present a fair example of what were popularly called standard oil methods, as well as what they could do to the minds and hearts of victims. The more intimately I went into my subject, the more hateful it became to me. No achievement on earth could justify those methods, I felt i had a great desire to end my task hear no more of it no doubt part of my revulsion was due to a fagged brain the work had turned out to be much longer and more laborious than i had had reason to expect the plan i had taken to mr mcclure in the fall of eighteen ninety which we had talked over in salso maggiore italy i still have notes of our talk on a yellow piece of the stationery of the hotel des termes called for three papers possibly twenty five thousand words but before we actually began publication mr phillips and mr mcclure decided we might venture on six we went through the six and the series was stretched to twelve before we were through we had nineteen articles and when the nineteen were off my hands i asked nothing in the world but to get them into a book and escape into the safe retreat of a library where i could study people long dead and if they did things of which i did not approve it would be all between me and the books there would be none of these harrowing human beings confronting me tearing me between contempt and pity admiration and anger baffling me with their futile and misdirected power or their equally futile and misdirected weakness i was willing to study human beings in the library but no longer for a time at least in flesh and blood so i thought the book was published in the fall of 1904, two fat volumes with generous appendices of what I considered essential documents. I was curious about the reception it would have from the Standard Oil Company. I had been told repeatedly they were preparing an answer to flatten me out, but if this was under way it was not with Mr. Rockefeller's consent, I imagined to a mutual friend who had told him the article should be answered mr rockefeller was said to have replied not a word not a word about that misguided woman to another who asked him about my charges he was reported as answering all without foundation the idea of the standard forcing anyone to sell his refinery is absurd the refineries wanted to sell to us and nobody that has sold or worked with us has but made money is glad he did so i thought once of having an answer made to the mcclure articles but you know it has always been the policy of the standard to keep silent under attack and let their acts speak for themselves in the case of the lloyd book they had kept silent but only because mr rockefeller had been unable to carry out his plans for answering what he had proposed was a jury of the most distinguished clergymen of the day to consider mr lloyd's argument and charges 
certain clergymen invited refused unless there should be a respectable number of economists added to the jury that apparently mr rockefeller did not see his way to do and the plan was abandoned so far as i know mr lloyd's book was never answered by the standard oil company but i wanted an answer from mr rockefeller what i got was neither direct nor from my point of view serious it consisted of wide and what must have been a rather expensive anonymous distribution of various critical comments the first of these was a review of the book which appeared in the nation soon after its publication the writer one of the nation's staff reviewers i later learned sneered at the idea that there was anything unusual in the competitive practices which i called illegal and immoral they are a necessary part of competition he said the practices are odious it is true competition is necessarily odious was it necessarily odious i did not think so the practices i believed i had proved i continued to consider much more dangerous to economic stability than airing them even if i aired them in the excited and irrational fashion the review charged as i saw it the struggle was between commercial machiavellism and the christian code the most important part of the indirect answers was an able book by gilbert holland montague it separated business and ethics in a way that must have been a comfort to twenty six broadway as soon as it was published mr montague's book became not exactly a best seller but certainly a best circulator libraries ministers teachers prominent citizens all over the land receiving copies with the compliments of the publisher numbers of them came back to me with irritated letters we have been buying books for years from this house wrote one distinguished librarian and never before was one sent with their compliments i understand that libraries all over the country are receiving them can it be that this is intended as an advertisement or is it not more probable that the standard oil company itself is paying for this widespread distribution the general verdict seemed to be that the latter was the explanation some time later there came from the entertaining elbert hubbard of the roycroft shop of east aurora new york an essay on the standard extolling the grand results from the centralization of the industry in their hands i have it from various interested sources that five million copies were ordered printed in pamphlet form by the standard oil company and were distributed by mr hubbard they went to school teachers and journalists preachers and leaders from the atlantic to the pacific hardly were they received in many cases before they were sent to me with angry or approving comments for a couple of years my birthday and christmas offerings were sure to include copies of one or the other of these documents with the compliments of some waggish member of the mcclure group i had hoped that the book might be received as a legitimate historical study but to my chagrin i found myself included in a new school that of the muckrakers theodore roosevelt then president of the united states had become uneasy at the effect on the public of the periodical press's increasing criticisms and investigations of business and political abuses he was afraid that they were adding to the not inconsiderable revolutionary fever abroad driving people into socialism something must be done and in a typically violent speech he accused the school of being concerned only with the vile and debasing its members were like the man in john bunyan's pilgrim's progress who with eyes on the ground raked incessantly the straws the small sticks and dust of the floor they were muckrakers the conservative public joyfully seized the name roosevelt had of course misread his bunion the man to whom the interpreter called the attention of the pilgrim was raking riches which the interpreter contemptuously called straws and sticks and dust the president would have been nearer bunion's meaning if he had named the rich sinners of the times who in his effort to keep his political balance he called malefactors of great wealth if he had called them muckrakers of great wealth and applied the word malefactors to the noisy and persistent writers who so disturbed him 
i once argued with mr roosevelt that we on mcclure's were concerned only with facts not on stirring up revolt i don't object to the facts he cried but you and baker baker at that time was carrying on an able series of articles on the manipulations of the railroads but you and baker are not practical i felt at the time mr roosevelt had a good deal of the unusual conviction of the powerful man in public life that correction should be left to him a little resentment that a profession outside his own should be stealing his thunder this classification of muckraker which i did not like helped fix my resolution to have done for good and all with the subject which had brought it on me but events were stronger than i all the radical reforming element and i numbered many friends among them were begging me to join their movements i soon found that most of them wanted a tax they had a little interest in balanced findings now i was convinced that in the long run the public they were trying to stir would weary of vituperation that if you were to secure permanent results the mind must be convinced one of the most heated movements at the moment was the effort to persuade the public to refuse all gifts which came from fortunes into the making of which it was known illegal and unfair practices had gone do not touch tainted money men thundered from pulpit and platform among them so able a man as dr washington gladden the rockefeller fortune was singled out because about this time mr rockefeller made some unusually large contributions to colleges and churches and general philanthropy it is done cried the critics in order to silence criticism frequently someone said to me you have opened the rockefeller purse but i knew and said in print rather to the disgust of my friends in the movement that there was an unfairness to mr rockefeller in this outcry it did not take public criticism to open his purse from boyhood he had been a steady giver in proportion to his income ten per cent went to the lord and through all the harrowing early years in which he was trying to establish himself as a money-maker he never neglected to give the lord the established proportion as his fortune grew his gifts grew larger he not only gave but saw the money given was wisely spent and he trained his children particularly the son who was to administer his estate to as wise practice in public giving as we have ever had that is it did not take a public outcry such as came in the early years of this century against the methods of the standard oil company to force mr rockefeller to share his wealth he was already sharing it indeed in the fifteen years before nineteen o four he had given to one or another cause some thirty-five million dollars if his gifts were larger at this time than they had ever been before his money-making was greater if they were more spectacular than ever before it may have been because he thought it was time to call the public's attention to what they were getting out of the standard oil fortune at all events it seemed to me only fair that the point should be emphasized that it had not taken a public revolt against his methods to force him to share his profits i could not escape the controversies hard as i tried nor could i escape events events which were forcing me against my will to continue my observations and reports my book was hardly published before it was apparent that the oil field which it had covered and which for so long had been supposed to be the only american oil field of importance was soon to be surpassed by those in the southwest the first state to force recognition of the change on the country at large was kansas where suddenly in the spring of nineteen o five there broke out an agitation as unexpected to most observers as it was interesting to those who knew their oil history kansas we old-timers told ourselves was duplicating what the oil creek had done in eighteen seventy two it was putting on a revolt how had it come about for a number of years wildcatters with or without money had been prospecting for oil in the state only a modest production was rewarded them at first but in nineteen o four oil suddenly poured forth in great quantities on the instant kansas went oil mad 
practically every farmer in the state dreamed of flowing wells as soon as it was proved that kansas was to be a large field the standard took charge it leased drilled and most important it threaded the state with its pipeline system no sooner was oil proved to be on a farmer's land than the pipeline people were there caring for it at market rates but they began not only to develop and handle scientifically and efficiently but quite as scientifically and efficiently they began to get rid of all the small fry that in the early days of small wells had been refining and marketing they would take all the oil that kansas could produce they said but on their own terms they wanted no interference as soon as this became clear to kansas the state rose in revolt the populists who for six years now must needs grumble in a corner came out to inveigh with all of their old fervor against the trust women's clubs took it up political parties took it up a program was developed the gist of which was that Kansas would take care of its own oil. Bills were introduced into the legislature calculated to control railroad rates, pipeline rates, competitive marketing. To the joy of the populists and to the horror of the conservatives, a bill for a state refinery was presented by the governor himself. Kansas had a hemp factory in the state penitentiary, not doing so badly why should not the penitentiary run an oil refinery too the legislature agreed to do it the excitement grew and so attracted the attention of the country that the office concluded that i must go out and see what i could make of it i did not much want to go not only because of my desire to free myself of the subject but because my heart was too heavy with personal loss to feel enthusiasm for any task in the spring of 1905, my father had died after a long, slow illness. To me, he had always been everything that is summed up in the word dear. Modest, humorous, hard-working, friendly, faithful in what he conceived to be the right. He loved his family and friends and church and asked only to serve them. His business associates held him as a man of honor and a gentleman father's death for a time darkened my world later i began to realize that the dearness of him was to remain as a permanent thing in my life but in 1905 this sense of continued companionship was something which came slowly out of a dark sea of loss so it was with a heavy heart that i went to see what was happening in kansas first i wanted to see with my own eyes if the fields i had been hearing about were as rich as advertised so I spent some ten days driving about southeastern Kansas and northeastern Oklahoma, then just coming in with the promise of great wells. It was about as exciting a journey as I have ever made. It was on one of these trips I saw my first dust storm. Driving in a buckboard behind two spirited horses across a practically unbroken prairie, my companion suddenly looked behind him. Jehoshaphat, he shouted. Wrap your head up. I turned to see the sky from horizon to zenith filled with dark rolling clouds. It was not from fire. What was it? A dust storm, my companion cried. Quickly and expertly he prepared to take it. He loosened the check reins of the horses, and the spirited animals, evidently knowing what they were in for, dropped their heads as low as they could hold them and leaned up against each other. We wrapped ourselves as closely as we could, and, like the horses, clung to each other. The storm did not last long, but it was pretty awful while it did. The air was thick, you could not breathe. But it passed, and I was ordered to shake myself out. I found that I was almost engulfed with a fine black dust, that it was packed close to the hubs of the wheels of our buckboard. It was ten days before I got rid of that dust, for it was ten days before I had a real bath. The dust had turned the primitive water supplies into a muddy liquid, quite impossible to drink and hopeless for cleansing. The wonder of it was that the real discomforts counted not at all at the time. I had joined an eager, determined, exultant procession of wild catters and promoters, of youths looking for their chance or seeking adventure for the first time, tasting it to the full. 
nothing so great as this kansas and indian territory field had ever been known every well was to be a gusher every settlement a city on every side they were selling town lots and stock in oil companies one of the most irresponsible stock-selling schemes i had ever known i happened on in one of these trips two anxious-faced boys were going about among experienced oil men begging them for oil leases preferably oil leases on which there was a proved well the lads had come as sightseers and had been caught in the wild excitement of the region everybody had a scheme to make himself and his friends rich why not they and largely as a joke they had sent out a flamboyant letter offering stock in a mythical oil field the letter had gone to scores of innocents in the east and in answer school teachers clergymen and women with little or no money had poured in subscriptions if there had been a few subscriptions they would have been able to return them but here they were when i saw them with literally a suitcase full of checks and money orders and not a foot of land leased and in the excitement there was practically no land to be had they must either get a lease or go to the penitentiary they concluded hence their alarm their pitiful begging of older men to help them out of the predicament into which their irresponsibility had plunged them it was not long before i found i was being taken for something more serious than a mere journalist conservative standard oil sympathizers regarded me as a spy and not infrequently denounced me as an enemy to society independent oil men and radical editors who were in the majority called me a prophet it brought fantastic situations where i was utterly unfit to play the part a woman of twenty-five fresh full of zest only interested in what was happening to her would have reveled in the experience but here i was fifty fagged wanting to be let alone while i collected trustworthy information for my articles dragged to the front as an apostle the funniest things were the welcomes the funniest of all was at the then new town of tulsa oklahoma i had arrived late at night in what seemed to me a no-man's land and after considerable trouble had found a place in a rough little hostelry where i was so suspicious of the look of things that i moved the bureau against the lockless door i am now sure that i was as safe there as i should have been in my bed at home i had registered of course and the next morning before i had finished my breakfast i was waited on by the editor of the local newspaper who took me to his office a barn-like structure next door for an interview almost immediately a handsome youth in knickerbockers and high-laced boots came hurriedly in i think i ought to tell you miss tarbell he said with a grin that you are in for a serenade a serenade i said what do you mean well he said the tulsa boomers have been making a tour of cities to the north their special train has just come in they want something to celebrate and learning that you were in town they are sending up the band to welcome you they want a speech i had never made an impromptu speech in my life i was horrified at the idea you must get me out of this i begged of my gallant but very amused informer no he said there is no way to escape here they are and there they were a band of thirty or forty pieces several of the players stalwart indians i had to face it and for once in my life i had a happy idea go buy me two boxes of the best cigars that are to be had in town and i shoved a bill into his hand go quickly and then the band began not so bad but so funny there i was standing on the sidewalk with all the masculine inhabitants of tulsa so it seemed to me packed about some of them serious and some of them highly delighted at my obvious consternation i had not guessed wrong about the cigars they preferred them to a speech i saw as i passed around the circle distributing them to the players what was left i gave to the bodyguard which had assembled to back me up a compliment i have always treasured was given by one of the indians as he watched me disposing of my goods he all right 
still more flattering it was as i went around in tulsa that day to meet gentlemen who had fat cigars tied with little red ribbons in their buttonholes and to have them point gaily to them as i passed but the serenade was not the end of the celebration that afternoon i was taken out in a barouche the only one in the countryside i was told the band behind and paraded up and down the distracted streets of tulsa a day or two later when i went on my journey it was with a seat full of candy magazines books flowers everything that the community afforded for a going away present i never had been before nor have been since so much the prima donna but all this was preliminary to the real task of finding out what was happening in kansas outside of the production of oil the legislation already passed was intended to make the standard oil company the servant of the state but i had long ago learned it was one thing to pass laws and another thing to enforce and administer them how were they getting on i went first to see the governor e w hoke a humorless and honest man it was he who had sponsored the state refinery i found him impressed by what he had done but a little doubtful about how things were going to come out he was opening his mail when i went in and he showed me letters nominating him for the presidency he had been receiving many of them he said it was obvious they came from radical socialists rejoicing over the encouragement that he was giving to the public ownership of industry he liked the applause but did not like the source he was no socialist he protested to me he was a firm believer in the competitive system the state refinery was a measuring stick he had wanted to settle definitely just what the profits of the refinery business in kansas were nobody knew except experts and they wouldn't tell a first-class oil refinery would settle for all time the cost of refining kansas oil and force the sale at a reasonable price he was not trying to drive private industry out of the state he merely wanted to force private industry to be reasonable the private industry being of course the standard oil company governor hoke and the state as a whole were soon feeling the effect of the letdown which always follows an exciting legislative campaign particularly for the winner not since the early nineties had kansas enjoyed so rousing a time and now it was over and they had to come down to business but could they get down to business could they administer the new laws meetings were being held half in jubilation over the successful legislation half in anxiety about the next step i was asked to come in and speak at one of them i was no speaker but i could not let them down moreover because of my familiarity with past exciting experiments on the part of indignant oil independence i realized better than they did so i thought the hard pull they had before them your problem now i told them is to do business as far as laws can ensure it you have free opportunity but good laws and free opportunity alone do not build up a business unless you can be as efficient and as patient as far-seeing as your great competitor laws or no laws you will not succeed you must make yourselves as good refiners as good transporters as good marketers as ingenious as informed as imaginative in your legitimate undertakings as they are in both their legitimate and illegitimate my speech was not popular what they wanted from me was a rousing attack on the standard oil company they wanted a merry lease to tell them to go on raising hell and here i was telling them that they had got all they could by raising hell and now they must settle down to doing business you have gone over to the standard oil company said one disgusted populist i saw i had ruined my reputation as the joan of arc of the oil industry as someone had named me but there were hard-headed independent legislators and businessmen in the state who consoled me you are right we must learn to do business as well as they do one immediate national effect of the kansas disturbance was to arouse the legislatures of other oil-producing states in the southwest to enact laws not unlike those of kansas though i do not remember that a state refinery was sponsored anywhere else 
there was a wide demand that congress place the pipeline system under the interstate commerce commission subject it to the same restrictions as interstate rails but most important was the fine popular backing the row gave the trust-busting campaign of theodore roosevelt now president of the united states he had begun his attack on big business by putting an end to the first great holding company the country had seen, the Northern Securities Company. He had followed this by a bill establishing a department for which people had been asking for a decade or more, that of commerce and labor, including a bureau of corporations with power to examine books and question personnel. Congress at first shied at the measure, but Mr. Roosevelt thundered, if you do not pass it this session, I will call an extra session. And they knew he would. Ironically enough, it was the standard itself that broke the reluctance of Congress. The proposal had shocked it out of its usual discretion. There never was an organization in the country which held secrecy more essential to doing business. Breaking down the walls behind which it operated was not to be tolerated it seems to have been the peppery john archbold who took charge of the fight against the bill using all the political influence of the company which was considerable at that moment roosevelt soon learned something of what was going on it is not certain how much and when he saw his measure in danger he gave out the statement that john d rockefeller had wired his friends in the senate we are opposed to any antitrust legislation it must be stopped the last thing in the world that john d rockefeller would have done was to send such a telegram to anybody probably mr roosevelt knew that but somebody in the standard was passing on such a word and mr rockefeller was the responsible head of the organization his name did the work congress passed the bill in a hurry the bureau of corporations was speedily set up an excellent man at its head james garfield the first task assigned it by the president was an investigation of the petroleum industry. This investigation reported in 1906 that the Standard Oil Company was receiving preferential rates from various railroads, and had been for some time. One of the most spectacular business suits the company had seen up to that time followed. The Standard was found guilty by Judge Kennesaw Landis, the present arbitrator of the manners and morals of national baseball and a punishment long known as the big fine twenty nine million dollars inflicted the country gasped at the size of the fine but not so the bureau of corporations my correspondent there contended that over eight thousand true indictments had been found and that the maximum penalty would have amounted to over a hundred and sixty million dollars but even the twenty-nine million dollars so modest in the view of the bureau of corporations was not allowed to stand for in nineteen o eight judge peter grosskup of the circuit court of appeals in illinois upset it roosevelt was angry there is too much power in the bench he told his friends but by this time the government had under way another and a much more serious line of attack from which roosevelt was hoping substantial results Back in 1890, the Congress had enacted what was known as the Sherman Antitrust Law, a law making illegal every contract and combination restraining trade and fostering monopoly. The government was now seeking to apply this law to the Standard Oil Company. Was it not the first industry to attempt monopoly? Had it not been the model for all the brood? Such a suit was no new idea independent oil men had long talked of it and in eighteen ninety seven they had been ready to go ahead when at the last moment the lawyer to whom they had entrusted their case had suddenly taken ill and died it must have seemed to the energetic lewis emery jr who had been engineering the attack that the lord himself had gone over to the standard ten years went by and then in September 1907, the United States of America began its suit against the Standard Oil Company of New York at all. There were months and months of hearings. If I had been a modern newspaper woman, I could have made a good killing out of that long investigation, for more than one editor asked me to analyze the testimony as it came along, or give my impressions of the gentleman who appeared on the witness stand. But I had no stomach for it. I never attended a public examination, 
though of course i read the published testimony with care i knew well enough that the time would come when if i did my duty as a historian i must analyze the suit but that must be after it was ended and a sufficiently practical test had been made of the decision it would be a long time i told myself before i should be obliged to take up the story where i had left it End of chapter 12「Twelve years had gone by since I tied myself, temporarily, as I thought, to the McClure venture. To my surprise, the longer I was with the enterprise, the more strongly I felt it was giving me the freedom I wanted as well as a degree of that security which makes freedom so much easier a load to carry here was a group of people i could work with without sacrifice or irritation here was a healthy growing undertaking which excited me while it seemed to offer endless opportunity to contribute to the better thinking of the country the future looked fair and permanent and then without warning the apparently solid creation was shattered and I found myself sitting on its ruins. Looking back now, I know that the split in the McClure staff in 1906 was inevitable. Neither Mr. McClure nor Mr. Phillips, the two essential factors in the creation, could have done other than he did. The points at issue were fundamental. Each man acted according to an inner something which made him what he was, something he could not violate back of the difficulty lay the fact that at this time mr mcclure was a sick man the hardships of his youth and early manhood the intense pressure he had put on himself in founding his enterprises had exhausted him for several years he had been obliged to take long vacations usually in europe with his family his staff carrying on his work in his absence the enterprises were bringing him larger and larger returns and more and more honour but that was not what he most wanted. He wanted to be in the thick of things, feel himself an active factor in what was doing. Above all, he wanted to add to what he had already achieved, to build a bigger, a more imposing house of McClure. What he wanted was more money, I have heard men comment. They were wrong. I have never known a man freer from the itch for money as an end than S. S. McClure money for him meant power to do things to build to help others on his way up he had gathered about him a horde of dependents with whom he was always ready to share his last dollar he was reckless with money as with ideas in these years when he was practically living in europe though returning regularly to the united states his chief interest was not in what his enterprises were accomplishing, but in adding something bigger than they were or could be. Only by doing this could he prove to himself and to his colleagues that he was a stronger and more productive man than ever. Nothing else would satisfy him. His passion to build, to realize his ambitions, made him careless about laying foundations what he did usually had the character of improvisation frequently on a grand scale sometimes merely gay spurts of fancy i was myself caught up in one of the latter when mr mcclure in london suddenly ordered me in paris to drop whatever i was doing and to hurry into germany to collect material for an animal magazine animals were an abiding interest with mcclure's Richard Kipling laid the foundation in the Jungle Tales. After that great series, few were the numbers that did not have an animal in text and picture. It was as much a passion as baseball was to become in the latter days with the American magazine. I spent a lively month visiting zoos, interviewing animal trainers and hunters and keepers, buying books and photographs turning in what i considered a pretty good grist of materials and suggestions what became of it i never knew for i never heard a word of it after i came back to america 
the only remnant i have now of that month is a powder box of dresden china bought at the showrooms of the factory of the crossed swords it being my practice when on professional trips to use my leisure seeing the town guide-book in hand and buying all the souvenirs my purse permitted it was in nineteen o six that mr mcclure brought home from one of his foraging expeditions the plan which was eventually to wreck his enterprises he had it cut and dried ready to put into action without consultation with his partners he had organized a new company the charter of which provided not only for a mcclure's universal journal but a mcclure's bank a mcclure's life insurance company a mcclure's school book publishing company and later a mcclure's ideal settlement in which people could have cheap homes on their own terms it undertook to combine with a cheap magazine which it goes without saying was to have an enormous circulation with the enormous advertising which circulation brings an attempt to solve some of the great abuses of the day abuses at which we had been hammering in mcclure's magazine he proposed to do this by giving them a competition which would draw their teeth by the time mr mcclure got around to explaining his plan to me and asking my cooperation he had worked himself up to regarding it as an inspiration which must not be questioned it seemed to me to possess him like a religious vision which it was blasphemy to question obsessed as he was he was blind and deaf to the obstacles in the way i am sure i hurt mr mcclure by telling him bluntly and at once that i would never have anything to do with such a scheme in a recently published letter lincoln steffens tells how he saw mr mcclure's plan to him it was not only fool but not quite right certainly it was not right as organized it was a speculative scheme as alike as two peas to certain organizations the magazine had been battering the tragedy of the situation was that mr mcclure did not see and could not understand the arguments of his associates that his plan was not only impossible but wrong this failure of judgment was i am convinced due to his long illness the mental and physical exhaustion from which he was suffering and which he could not bring himself to understand or accept explains the unwisdom of this undertaking his contention that it was an inspiration his stubbornness in insisting that it be accepted and set to work human reason has little influence on one who believes he is inspired the members of the staff were little more than outsiders when it came to the final decision it was up to john phillips to accept and do his utmost to aid in the grandiose adventure or patiently to wait while persuading the general that it was not the mission of the mcclure crowd to reconstruct the economic life of the country that we were journalists not financial reformers i think no man ever tried harder to keep another from a suicidal undertaking and certainly no man could have been firmer from the start in his refusal to go along the struggle went on for six months and no two men ever tried more honestly to adjust their differences but they were irreconcilable it came to a point where one or the other must sell his interest in the magazine it was mr mcclure who bought out his partner although mcclure's magazine is no longer on the newsstands it does occupy a permanent place in the history of the period that it served because it worked itself into the literary and economic life of the country it was a magazine which from the first put quality above everything else and was willing to chase checks around town in order to pay for it for those who collect kipling there are the first publications of many of his rarest poems short stories and such distinguished serials as captains courageous and kim here first appeared willa cather and o henry it was a magazine which backed regardless of expense one might say the investigations and reports of men like ray stannard baker and lincoln steffens for twelve years it encouraged with liberality and patience the work of which i have been talking in this narrative mr mcclure had two editorial policies when it came to getting the thing he felt was important for the magazine 
first the writer must be well paid and the expense money be generous second and most important of all he must be given time he did not ask that you produce a great serial in six months he gave you years if it was necessary i spent the greater part of five years on the history of the standard oil company i was what was called a contributing editor that is i turned in suggestions as they came to me in my work around the country i did occasional extra articles that seemed to be in my line i read and took part in editorial councils but it was recognized that all the time i demanded should be given to the serial i know of no other editor and no other publisher who has so fully recognized the necessity of generous pay and ample time if he were to get from a staff work done according to the best editorial standard and worthy of the magazine and the writer when it was finally decided that mr phillips was to sever his long relation to mcclure's several members of the editorial staff resigned including ray stannard baker lincoln steffens john siddle the efficient young managing editor albert boyden and myself we could not see the magazine without mr phillips the last day we left the office then on twenty-third street near fourth avenue some of us went together to madison square and sat on a bench talking over our future we were derelicts without a job but not for long there was then in new york though it was not generally known a magazine group which wanted a change the magazine was very old long known as frank leslie's illustrated monthly recently changed to the american magazine its owner was frederick l culver its editor ellery sedgwick afterward editor of the atlantic its publisher william morrow after the founder of william morrow and company the book publishing house mr culver approached mr phillips why don't you take it over finally in council assembled our editorial group together with david a mckinley and john trainer of the mcclure business department decided to incorporate the phillips publishing company and buy the american magazine with what we could put in ourselves and money from the sale of stock to interested friends we secured funds for the purchase and sufficient working capital we left mcclure's in march six months later october nineteen o six appeared our first issue the announcement shows how seriously we took ourselves as befitted people who had seen something in which they deeply believed go to pieces we had been too cruelly bruised to take anything lightly but luckily we were able to make two additions to our staff each man with a vein of humor not to be dried up or muddled by any cataclysms william allen white and finley peter dunn mr dooley we had known mr white in the mcclure's office since the day of his famous editorial what's the matter with kansas after that came his boyville stories two or three of which mcclure's published and then at intervals studies of political situations and political figures it was not long before he began to come to new york he was a little city-shy then, or wanted us to think so. As I was one of the official entertainers of the group, it occasionally fell to me to take him by the hand, as he put it, and show him the town. I could have hardly had a more delightful experience. He judged New York by Kansas standards, and New York usually suffered. His affection and loyalty for his state, his appreciation and understanding of everything that she does, wise and foolish the incomparable journalistic style in which he presents her are what has made him so valuable a national citizen his crowning achievement among the many to be credited to him has been remaining first last and always the editor of the emporia gazette a staunch friendship had sprung up between mr white and mr phillips and it was natural enough that he interested himself in the new venture as for peter dunn we went after him and rather to my surprise he came along taking a desk in our cramped offices and appearing with amazing regularity at this time he was some forty years old the greatest satirist in my judgment the country has yet produced he had a wide knowledge of men and their ways there was no malice in his judgments but a great contempt for humbuggery as well as for all forms of self-deception devoted to uplifting the world 
however he felt kindly towards our ardent desire to improve things by demonstrating their unsoundness and approved our unwillingness to use any other tools than those which belonged legitimately to our profession he came out strongest in his contributions to the department of editorial comment which mr phillips had introduced under the head of the interpreter's house we were all supposed to contribute whatever was on our minds to this department mr phillips and mr dunn did the censoring and dovetailing i did not often make the interpreter's house much to my chagrin dunn said you sputter like a woman which i fear was true if it had not been for him the first christmas issue of the interpreter's house would have been bleak reading we had each of us broken forth in lament for the particular evil of the world which was disturbing us offering our remedies it seems to me wrote dunn editing our contributions that we are serving up a savory christmas number a nice present to be found in the bottom of a stocking you cannot go to the patent office in washington and take out a patent that will transform men into angels the way upward long and tedious as it is lies through the hearts of men it has been so since the founding of the feast nothing has been proved more clearly in the political history of the race than this that good will to men has done more to improve government than laws and wars let us close down our desks for the year if you want to find me for another week i will be found in the wonderful little toy shop around the corner that editorial broke the tension which had made me think this was no time to go home for christmas i went peter dunn hated the pains of writing his labor affected the whole office sympathy with what he was going through fear that his copy would not be in on time eagerness to see it when it came to know if it was one of his best but peter's work was never what he thought it ought to be and he sought forgetfulness indispensable on the new editorial staff seeing peter through his birth pains keeping the rest of us at our tasks nursing new writers making up the magazine was albert boyden he had come fresh from harvard to mcclure's and had at once made himself a place by his genius for keeping things going and his gift for sympathetic friendliness it was a combination which became more valuable and irresistible as time went on bert was everybody's friend whether editor artist or writer one can have friends one can have editors ray stannard baker was to write later but bert was both he was of the greatest value to the american in bringing together writers and artists who were attaching themselves to the new magazine bert was so fond of us all that he could not endure the idea that we did not all know one another and he made it his business to see that we had at least the opportunity he lived on the south of stuyvesant square four flights up there was no one in all that circle of distinguished contributors who did not welcome the chance to climb those stairs to bert's dinners and teas and what a group of people came they are recorded in his guest book booth tarkington edna ferber stuart edward white his wife and his brother gilbert julian and ada street the norrises the rices and martins of louisville joe chase will irwin and a dozen more along with visiting celebrities politicians scientists adventurers what talk went on in that high up living room what wonderful tales we heard bert was so much younger than the rest of us so full of enthusiasm and hope so much more vital in all shedding that it is still to me incredible that he should have left this world so much earlier than i he died in nineteen twenty five but he lives in a little book which j s p edited in his memory how proud bert would have been of that there is nobody like j s p he used to say many of his big circle of friends contributed their recollections of him i have never known another person in my life for whom quite such a book could have been written in spite of the gay unity of our group the vigor and steadiness with which it began and continued its operation i had suffered a heavy shock i know now i should not have taken it as well as i did and inwardly that was nothing to boast of if it had not been cushioned by an engrossing personal interest 
I had started out to make a home for myself. I had already made three major attempts to establish myself, first in Meadville, then in Paris, then in Washington, and all had failed. When, in 1898, it became evident that if I were to remain on the McClure staff, I must come to New York, I was in no mood to adopt a new home town. New York might be my writing headquarters, but Titusville should be home. Finally, I would return there, I told myself. But Titusville was 500 miles away. There were no airplanes in those days. The railroad journey was tedious and expensive. Weekending was impossible. I soon grew weary of the weekend makeshifts of a homeless person in a city. I wanted something of my own. And at last, by a series of circumstances, purely fortuitous, I acquired forty acres and a little old house in Connecticut. I had meant to let the land and the house run to seed if they wanted to. I had no stomach or money for a place. I wanted something of my very own with no cares. Idle dream in a world busy in adding artificial cares to the load nature lays on our shoulders. Things happened. The roof leaked. The grass must be cut if I was to have a comfortable sward to sit on. Water in the house was imperative. And what I had not reckoned with came from all the corners of my land. Incessant calls. Fields calling to be rid of underbrush and weeds and turn to their proper work. A garden spot calling for a chance to show what it could do. Apple trees begging to be trimmed and sprayed. I had bought an abandoned farm, and it cried loud to go about its business. Why should I not answer the cry? Why should I not be a farmer? Before I knew it, I was at least going through the motions, having fields plowed, putting in crops, planting an orchard, supporting horses, a cow, a pig, a poultry yard, giving up a new evening gown to buy fertilizer. Seeing what I was in for, and fearing, lest I should do as so many of my friends had done, go in deeper than my income justified, find myself borrowing and mortgaging in order to carry out the fascinating things I saw to do, I laid down a strict rule, which I have followed ever since, and which I recommend to people of limited incomes who acquire a spot in the country, and want it to be a continuous pleasure instead of a continuous anxiety. I resolved that I would spend only what I could lay aside from income, that I would divide this appropriation into three parts, one for the land, one for the house, one for furnishing. As the budget was very small, it meant that a thousand things that I wanted to do went undone, and still are undone. But it meant also that I had little or no financial anxiety. If the call of the land had been unexpected and not to be denied, even more unexpected and still less to be denied was the call of the neighborhood. I was not long in learning that in the houses I could see in valley and on hillside centered the most genuine of human dramas, tragic and comic. After the land and its background, the greatest gift of God to us, us including my niece, Esther, was our nearest neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. G. Burr Tucker, at the side of whose house swung a sign, Antiques for Sale. But it was as neighbors, not as customers, Mr. and Mrs. Tucker regarded us from the start. When Burr was not over helping us settle, he was watching what was going on from his front porch. I have never had more pungent, salty, faithful friends. They had spent most of their lives on the corner, not always selling antiques. Mrs. Tucker had taught in the schoolhouse at the top of the hill for twenty-nine years, and Burr had had a varied and picturesque career as a salesman of pumps, fruit trees, any gadget that seemed to be useful to his country neighbors. Not long before we moved in, he had discovered by accident that there were people in the outside world who bought old spinning wheels, ancient chairs, ancient pottery. Burr knew the contents of every garret and woodshed for twenty miles around, and when he made his discovery, he began systematically to buy them out. By the time I arrived on the scene, he had an established business. Not knowing whether we were going to like our new acquisition well enough to make it permanent, Esther and I had decided to furnish out of a department store basement, 
but in looking over burr's miscellaneous assortment my eye fell on an old-fashioned melodeon charming in line its bellows broken but easy to repair ten dollars i couldn't resist it and so i became almost from the first day a customer of my nearest neighbor it was a great day when burr went teaking as they called the hunt for treasures we would watch for his return and when his white horse and wagon loaded high with loot appeared down the road we were on the ground as soon as he was not only did the immediate vicinity yield rich and exciting material but a little distance away there were people from the world we knew there were the friends who had first shown me the country noble and ella hogson up the valley the center of a jolly and interesting group known as the valley crowd a mile or so away was one of the most interesting women in the literary world of that day jeanette gilder sister of richard watson gilder a lively writer and editor perhaps no woman in her time carried to more perfection the then feminine vogue for severe masculine dress stout shoes short skirt mannish jacket shirt tie hat stick they were the last word in style they suited her as they did few for she was large of frame with strong bold features and a fine swinging gait but the masculinity was all on the surface esther came home one day shouting with laughter miss gilder is a fake she wears silk petticoats and is afraid of mice soon after i acquired my farm the countryside was stirred by the news that mark twain was building only eight or nine miles away from us everybody seemed to know what was happening with the building the settling the life going on that was partly because of our omnivorous curiosity and partly because mark twain was a friendly neighbor he every now and then gave a great party sending the invitations around by our peripatetic butcher a member of one of our first families a gentleman as well as a good tradesman i have a few treasured recollections of days when jeanette gilder and i drove over to tea or lunch with mark twain heard great stories of the doings in his new home it was from him that i heard the story of the famous burglary it was from him i heard the story of one of the best practical jokes ever played when peter dunn and robert collier sent him an elephant not only was all this fun and excitement and novelty shared by my niece and those of my family who came to see what we were so excited about but every member of the american staff sooner or later appeared at the farm to look us over from the start our chief counsellor had been bert boyden who six months after i had taken the first option on the place had insisted on accompanying me to see whether i had better take it up bert looked at the oaks he looked at the gay little stream that ran across the land and without hesitation said buy it and buy it i did having had a part in the purchase bert superintended henceforth all changes he approved my plan of budgeting he helped me select the wallpapers which were hung he was interested in the larder for the winter in the summer when his family was at a distance j s p came often to discuss the perplexities of the magazine and rest himself from the commotion of the office the norrises came and kathleen named my pig who but kathleen would have called him juicy he looked it fat as butter the siddles came often for in the summer we kept their famous cat sammy siddle the rices the martins the bakers all came to look on that rough land and shell of a house and wonder i suspect how i could be happy with anything so simple be satisfied with no more pretentious plans than i had among those who came in those early days was one who has left a crimson streak across the history of his time jack reed jack just out of harvard was giving half time to the american half time to writing we would invite him for the weekend but he was never at the station when we drove over to find him likely he had missed his train taken a freight that was more fun and late in the evening he would come walking over the hilltop demanding food and a bed and we would sit long hearing the adventures of his day it was on one of these trips that jack found nearby a natural amphitheatre before he had left he had planned to buy the place and worked out in detail a greek theatre 
he started towards new york on foot expecting to raise money from friends en route i was all ready to put up money one of them told me not many years ago but when jack was back at his desk in new york he forgot the theatre i never heard of it afterwards that was the delightful creature jack reed was up to the time that he discovered what is called life he took it hard now his bones lie under a tomb in moscow one of the martyrs to lenin's great vision of the communal life end of chapter thirteen part one chapter thirteen part two of all in the day's work by ida tarbell the sleepervox recording is in the public domain off with the old on with the new all this was good for me cushioned the shock i had suffered convinced me that at least i had gotten my hands on something permanent a fundamental factor in my future security a home a home capable of feeding me if the worst came to the worst but while it was good for me it was not so good for my work on the magazine i had believed i could work better in the quiet of the country but i was discovering that the country was more exciting than the town and the office as i knew it its attractions were proving too much for the difficult task which had been assigned me in the planning for the first year of the american the task was nothing less than to write a history of the making of our tariff schedules from the civil war on it had been a natural enough selection for me after the experience with the history of the standard oil company for the tariff was quite as much a matter of popular concern at the moment as the trust had been in nineteen hundred there was a growing demand for revision how could we get into the fight a subject must be found for me how about the tariff was a historical treatment possible i thought so at least i so despised the prohibitive tariff that i was willing to try if the magazine was willing to back me i suppose most of us have had at various periods of our life homemade remedies for the economic ills we see about us when i was a girl in high school i looked on an eight-hour day of productive labor for everybody as the way out i was much less worried by the hardships the long day brought working people than the mental and moral deterioration i imagined suffered by people who did not work idleness not labor was the scourge of the world for me the eight-hour day was a save the idle day before i left the chautauquan i had concluded that there was a trilogy of wrongs all curable responsible for our repeated depressions and our poorly distributed wealth discrimination in transportation tariffs save for revenue only private ownership of natural resources i was still of that opinion when largely by accident i had my chance to strike at number one in my trilogy could i by the method i had followed in that case and the only one i knew how to use present a plausible argument against number two what had particularly aroused me was the way tariff schedules were made the strength of what we now call pressure groups the powerful lobbies in wool and cotton and iron and sugar which for twenty-five years i had watched mowing congress down like a high wind there was no concealment of the pressure the lobbyists went at it hammer and tongs and battered down opposition with threats bribes and unparalleled arrogance by these tactics they had overcome mr cleveland's famous tariff message of eighteen eighty six had passed the outrageous mckinley bill of eighteen ninety had ruined the wilson bill of eighteen ninety three had defeated the promise of mckinley and dingley and aldrich to lower duties in eighteen ninety six and had substituted the highest and most distorted schedules the country had yet seen but it looked in nineteen o six as if the day of judgment was near and i asked nothing better than to be on the jury i went into it blindly on faith certainly not on knowledge and i had a handicap that i was far from realizing at the time that was that while in the case of the standard oil i had spent my life close to the events the tariff and its makers had never touched my life this was something i had read in a book 
another handicap was that my indignation was directed towards legal acts congress had adopted these schedules under coercion if you please but still it had adopted them the beneficiaries had the sanction of law it was a different case from challenging railroad discriminations which were forbidden by law as i worked on the congressional record and related documents i looked up men still living who had had a part in the struggle on one side or the other there were many of them scattered around the country now out of congress for the most part but not averse to talking as a rule i got little from them the fight which seemed to me so important was a dead issue to them they had lost or won it was all part of a game fresh from reading the daily discussions in the record curious about this or that man or argument i found them hazy often not particularly interested there was little of the righteous indignation which i thought i found in their recorded speeches had that been political instead of righteous indignation i began to think so it was grover cleveland who put heart in me he had lost none of his righteous indignation over the aid prohibitive tariffs were giving certain trusts none of his alarm over the growing disparity between industry and agriculture they were fostering he felt deeply the wrong of the prices they were inflicting on the farmer the professional class the poor i got nothing but encouragement from him for the review i had planned luckily i already had a pleasant working relation with mr cleveland it had come about in my last two years on mcclure's when my chief editorial task had been trying to persuade him that it was his duty to write his reminiscences for us incidentally offering myself as a ghost if he felt that he needed one as his letters to me at this time show he was not entirely unfriendly to the project i want to do the thing and yet i am afraid the difficulties in the way of doing it are fundamental and inexorable you see the project requires me to exploit myself and my doings before the public i do not see how i can do this though i am terribly vain and often bore my friends privately by tiresome reminiscence and yet i cannot but think that there are incidents and results in my career which by their narration might be of service in stimulating those who aspire to good citizenship and there we are this latter consideration hints of duty but then comes the fear that what seems to me duty is a mere fantastic notion and thereupon the old disinclination resumes its sway i have frequently thought no one could help me so much as you and it has seemed to me more than once that you and i might possibly cook up something in a summer vacation's freedom from distractions nothing came at this time nineteen o four of the tarbell cleveland fantasy as mr cleveland gaily dubbed it and two years later the project was dismissed but in a letter so friendly that i cannot resist quoting from it i do not believe a man who has turned the corner of sixty-nine years is any less vain and self-satisfied than when he was a youth at any rate here i am in this sixty-nine predicament delighted with the generous things you say of me in the goodness of your heart and more than halfway deluding myself into the notion that i deserve them i want to be very sensible and hard-headed in this affair but in any event i am entitled to rejoice in your good opinion of me and your hearty wishes for my welfare and happiness i thank you from the bottom of my heart for them and i shall gratefully remember them as long as i live somehow i have an idea that you know me well and surely i need not afflict myself with the fear of vanity if i have found a friend in you with those letters in my files i felt free when i undertook the tariff work for the american to ask mr cleveland to talk to me about the making of his tariff message in eighteen eighty six and the failure of the wilson bill in eighteen ninety three he was most generous and when i had completed my story of the two episodes i asked him to read the manuscript and give me a candid judgment and of course his corrections and his suggestions the chief suggestion that he made shows a sensitiveness to his literary style in public documents which i had not suspected charming letter-writer as mr cleveland was in his public documents he was ponderous 
i must have enlarged a little on this for i find this paragraph in his letter with which he sent back the proofs i have ventured to suggest a little toning down of your characterization of my style thinking perhaps you would be willing to make an alteration to please me if for no other reason you know we are all a little sensitive on such a point there was another paragraph in that letter which touched me deeply your article has caused me to feel again the greatest sorrow and disappointment i have ever suffered in my public career the failure of my party to discharge its most important duty and its fatuous departure from its appointed mission but lean as heavily as i dared on mr cleveland work as i would and did on the tariff debates of congress i can wish my worst enemy no greater punishment than reading them in full i could not put vitality into my narrative it was of the congressional record it was second-hand it was the making of the payne aldrich bill in nineteen o nine that finally gave a certain life to my narrative here was something belonging to the present not something of the past by all the signs theodore roosevelt should have been the st george to lead in the revision the public was calling so loudly for particularly after the panic of nineteen o seven few of his party leaders paid attention are not all our fellows happy speaker joseph cannon asked as the demand for revision became louder roosevelt himself heard it but frankly said to his intimates that he did not know anything about the tariff he did not and he would not take the time to learn he hammered at the effects of privilege pursued malefactors of great wealth but was not willing to do the hard studying of the causes which produced the malefactors mr taft who followed roosevelt had no choice the platform on which he was elected called unequivocally for tariff reform and as soon as he was inaugurated he called a special session to do the work my chagrin was great when i realized at once that all the ancient technique i had been trying to discredit was repeating itself it is i told myself the same old circus the same old gilded chariots the same old clowns so far as arguments were concerned they might have been taken from the hearings of eighty three of eighty eight of ninety three of ninety six figures were changed and nobody could deny that these figures of growth were impressive but they came from interested men they are incapable of judging mr carnegie told the committee no judge should be permitted to sit in a cause in which he is interested you make the greatest mistake in your life if you attach importance to an interested witness the process which sunset cox back in the seventies characterized as reciprocal rapine buying votes for the schedule their constituents wanted by voting for schedules they could not justify was in full swing never was the tariff as the cause of prosperity worked harder it was the answer of the prohibitive protectionist to the charge that the tariff was a tax in all the early years they had called it so a tax to produce revenue encourage new industries protect higher wages a better standard of living but mr cleveland had called it boldly a vicious inequitable illogical tax and illustrated his adjectives tellingly the effect of his attack was so disastrous that the supporters of prohibitive duties went into a huddle to find a new name the cause of prosperity was the euphemism they produced a repeater that had figured in every tariff bill was the answer of the priests of the dogma to the argument that the poor should be considered according to the pictures they drew there were no poor in the united states this refusal to recognize poverty was no more discouraging in the making of the bill of nineteen o nine than the indifference to the effect high tariffs were having on the cost of the necessities of life in this they ran true to historical precedent from the time the business man took charge in the late seventies any attempt to call the attention at hearings to what a duty would do to the price of a necessity of life was ignored or jeered justice brandeis then plain lawyer brandeis was before a committee considering the dingley bill and for whom do you appear he was asked 
for the consumer he answered the committee chairman and all laughed aloud but they were good enough to say oh let him run down this old indifference to the effects of higher prices on the living of the poor stirred me to the only article in my series which seemed to take hold i called it where every penny counts the worthwhile thing from my point of view was that it reached women i never knew what the tariff meant before jane adams wrote me here was something which touched those in whom she was interested wage earners she knew from actual contact what the increase of a cent in the price of a quart of milk a spool of thread a pound of meat meant to working girls with their six or eight dollars a week she knew that every penny added to the cost of their food clothes or coal gave less warmth less covering it was not difficult to show that what they were trying to do in washington in the making of the payne aldrich bill was just that a tariff that would add to the cost of things that must be had if people were to live at all to my deep satisfaction this effort to make the new tariff bill in the good old way was promptly met by a rousing challenge from a group of progressive republican senators men who had been largely responsible for forcing the promise to reform into the party platform when they discovered that there would be no reform if the lobbyists and their friends in congress could prevent it they crystallized into one of the most vigorous and intelligent fighting bands that had been seen for many years in congress insurgents they were called the leader in the revolt interested in railroad reform rather than the tariff was la follette of wisconsin others were beveridge of indiana cummins and dolliver of iowa bora of idaho and bristow of kansas they were already familiar figures at the american along with certain members of the house particularly the salty and peppery william kent of california phillips baker and stephens being in frequent communication with them the most brilliant and witty as well as the most thoroughly informed of the tariff insurgents was the amiable senator dolliver from iowa twenty years in congress always regular always stoutly supporting the tariff bills turned out by the committee what ails you now i asked him well he said i had been going on for twenty years taking practically without question what they handed me but these alliances between the party and industrial interests have at last set me thinking i began to understand something of the injustice that was being done to the consumer and then we promised to reform the tariff when the insurgents divided up the schedules for study schedule k wool the most difficult and the most important politically fell to senator dolliver he found he had been voting for years for duties which when he sat down to read the schedule he could not understand he discovered they were a mixture of tricks evasions and discriminations intended to be so he believed he determined to master them and master them he did by months of the severest night work he pored over statistics and technical treatises he visited mills and importing houses and retail shops he sought the aid of experts and in the end he knew his subject so well that he went on to the floor of the senate without a manuscript and literally played with schedule k and incidentally also with senator aldrich who was said to fly to the cloak-room whenever senator dolliver rose to speak when he had finished his clean competent dissection schedule k lay before the senate a law without principles or morals and yet just as it was the senate of the united states passed it and the president of the united states signed it and it went on the statute books why neither mr taft nor mr aldrich defended the wool schedule which made the bill odious they both were frank in explaining that it was politically necessary not at all a question of the fairness of the schedule but a question of what powerful interests demanded the wool interests could defeat the bill if they did not get what they wanted my conviction about the inequity of schedule k was so strong that when the outlook published a long defense of it plainly an advertisement but not so marked 
i protested in a personal letter to its vociferous contributing editor theodore roosevelt with whom by this time i was on fairly friendly terms just what i said in my letter about the herald which so stirred his wrath i do not remember but his answer to my comment is so typically rooseveltian in temper and reasoning that i think it should be preserved may sixth nineteen eleven oh miss tarbell miss tarbell how can you take the view you do of the herald you compare it with the tribune it is perfectly legitimate to compare the tribune with mr watterson's paper the courier journal honest people could agree or disagree about those two papers personally i think that during the last thirty or forty years the tribune has been infinitely more helpful to good causes than the courier journal but as i say people can differ on such a subject and i should be very glad to meet at any time either henry waterston or whitelaw reed but to compare either one of them with the herald is literally and precisely as if i should compare either the american magazine or the outlook with town topics having expressed his opinion of the herald he proceeded to an elaborate specious explanation of the matter which had so stirred my ire that i had protested to him now as for what you say about the outlook's publishing the truth about k in the first place i admit at once that the title the type and the placing of this advertisement did make it look to many readers like an editorial article we used the same title, type, and placing that had been used for similar articles for twenty years, but our attention was subsequently called to the fact, to which you now call my attention, i.e. that some people were misled in the matter, and in consequence we at once abandoned this twenty years' custom. From now on, every article of the kind will appear under the heading of Advertising Department or Advertising Section, so that there cannot be any possible mistake in the future. As for the publication of the article itself, I most emphatically think that it was not only justifiable, but commendable. The Outlook publishes continually letters from people upholding policies or view with which the Outlook diametrically disagrees for example the outlook has on several different occasions published letters taking a very dark view of my own character and achievements whether at san juan hill or elsewhere this particular article by spencer i should have been glad to see published in the regular section of the outlook as putting forth his side of the case just as i am now trying to secure publication in the outlook of an article from the northwestern farmers giving their side of the case against canadian reciprocity spencer's article however was too long and such being the case as i say i was not merely willing but glad to see it put in i did not know it had been put in of course until long after it had appeared but when i did see it i was glad that it had been put in probably you know that on april eighth the outlook editorially took up this question stated that the american woolen company was entirely justified in printing their article as an advertisement and that the outlook violated in no degree the ethics of journalism in admitting the advertisement to its pages and expressed its total disagreement with the views expressed in the article i would have gone further than this i would have stated that the outlook did not violate the ethics of journalism but rendered a great and needed service as an example in showing its willingness to accept the statement of a case with which it did not agree to put it in exactly as it was written and then itself to comment with absolute freedom as it has done upon the arguments made in the advertisement let me repeat that if the outlook had had space which it unfortunately did not have i should have been glad to see spencer's article inserted not as an advertisement but as a communication signed by spencer and avowedly stating his side of the case sincerely yours theodore roosevelt i felt i had won my case with mr roosevelt's assurance that henceforth every article of the kind would appear under the head of advertising department when the payne aldrich bill was finally passed with mr taft's and mr aldrich's brutally frank explanations i was done with the tariff as a subject for further study and writing four years later came the democratic effort to make a revision i had only the most casual interest 
It was the same old method. They might make a better bill, I told myself, but there could never be a fair one as long as tariffs were set by a Congress under the thumb of people personally interested. One thing seemed clear to me which is still clearer now. The combined prohibitive tariff industries were digging their own grave. Foreign markets they had to have, but they refused to buy from those to whom they wanted to sell. What the gentlemen did not realize was that by this procedure they were practically forcing nations not naturally industrial to copy their methods, industrialize themselves. These nations soon were succeeding with such skill that in spite of the boosting of the tariff again and again, the foreigners continued to undersell us. But the prohibitive protectionists were building a future competitor threatening to be stronger than foreign trade, this in the realm of politics. There had been no more hardy and conscienceless supporters of prohibitive tariffs than certain groups of organized labor, conspicuously the amalgamated steel and iron workers under John Jarrett. They were not a numerous body, but with the cry of the full dinner pail, they were able to back the demands of the employers. They had a body of votes that no political party dared defy. But in teaching organized labor the power of political pressure, the industrialists gave them a weapon that they did not see might one day be turned against themselves. Back in the 80s, one of the wisest and soundest economists we have produced, David A. Wells, said in substance of the victory of the tariff lobbies, This is a revolution. It will take another revolution to overthrow the leadership now established by businessmen. I felt after the bill of 1909 that there was nothing for an outsider like me to do but wait for that revolution. I felt this so deeply that when President Wilson invited me to be a member of the tariff commission he formed in December 1916, I refused. I was pleased, of course, that Mr. Wilson thought me fit for such a place. I knew that I should find the associations interesting. The dean of tariff students in the United States, Dr. Tossig of Harvard, was the chairman. To be under him would be an education that would be worth the taking. But I did not hesitate. First, there was my personal situation, my obligations. I had no right to give up my profession for a connection of that sort, in its nature temporary. Then I realized my own unfitness, as Mr. Wilson could not. I had had no experience in the kind of work this required. I was an observer and reporter, not a negotiator. I am not a good fighter in a group. I forget my duty in watching the contestants. But primarily, there was my hopelessness about the service the Tariff Commission might render. Its researches and its conclusions however sound, would stand no chance in Congress when a wool or iron or steel or sugar lobby appeared. A tariff commission was hamstrung from the start. Of course, it was not only my interest in work on the tariff that had led Mr. Wilson to offer me the position. He was looking about for women to whom he could give recognition. He was an outspoken advocate of suffrage and wanted to use women when he thought them qualified. Jane Adams pleaded with me to accept for the sake of women, but I did not feel that women were served merely by an appointment to office. Women, like men, serve in proportion to their fitness for office, to the actual fact that they have something to contribute. I had no enthusiasm for the task, did not even respect it greatly. I believed, too, that Harm is done all around by undertaking technical jobs without proper scientific training. The cause of women is not to be advanced by putting them into positions for which they are untrained. The press comments on the idea of a woman on this commission were not unfriendly, as far as I saw them, but they were a little surprised, and, as I was to find later, protests were made to Mr. Wilson. My friend Ray Stannard Baker, working on the Wilson papers, came across an answer of the President on December 27, 1916, to one protesting gentleman, which I am not too modest to print. 
as a matter of fact she has written more good sense good plain common sense about the tariff than any man i know of and is a student of industrial conditions in this country of the most serious and sensible sort End of chapter 13, part 2